Uh, welcome everyone. Thank you all so very much for joining us today. We do have a full meeting. We had full registration. Um, my name is Jennifer Tobin and I am the Deputy Administrator of the Natural Hazards Center. And we are so excited to be hosting this webinar today to learn from 15 teams of amazing scholars who have been studying the most pressing public health and disaster concerns across the U.S. territories. This research was funded as part of a special call for proposals from the Public Health Disaster Research Award Program at the Natural Hazards Center, generously funded by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention with support from the National Science Foundation. I would like to take a moment to thank all of the presenters today and all of the authors and teams that contributed to this research. I would also like to thank the volunteer moderators today. In addition to myself, we have Heather Shimpo, who is a graduate research assistant at the Natural Hazards Center and a PhD student in the Department of Sociology at the University of Colorado Boulder. We have Megan Morty, who is a research associate at the Natural Hazards Center, and Haure Ru, who is a uh, assistant professor in the School of Social Work at Dalhousie University in Canada. And finally, thank you to Katie Murphy and the rest of the Natural Hazards Center team for helping to make this webinar possible. In a moment, I will discuss the logistics of how these presentations will unfold, but first I would like to introduce the lovely Tracy Thomas, who is a senior health scientist in the Center for Preparedness and Response at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Her research experience includes vaccine safety, immunization program delivery, and disaster preparedness. Tracy is going to share some slides and provide a more in-depth overview of the inspiration for this special call for research in the U.S. territories. Tracy, feel free to go ahead and share your slides. Okay, thank you, Jennifer. And please let me know when you're able to see my screen. Those look perfect. Okay, perfect. Oh gosh, now I'm having technical difficulties. <laughs> All right, we'll just go with this. Um, so good, good afternoon, um, good morning, depending on where you are. I'm Tracy Thomas, and it is really a pleasure for me to be here today um, during this webinar. On behalf of leadership here at the Centers for Disease Control, um, from our associate directors and our deputy directors, um, Dr. Robin Solar, as well as other CDC staff, it is really a great pleasure um, to be able to have this webinar and to really see uh, the return on the investment on having this funding opportunity. I also would like to welcome our other partners. I would like to borrow from the African proverb, it takes a village. Well, this would not have been possible without a village from the National Science Foundation, from leadership at the Natural, Natural Hazard Center, and you, the funded investigators, who really responded to this quick call for rapid response research and really did an excellent job on submitting proposals and doing meaningful projects that had the potential to have a huge impact in communities throughout the U.S. territories. When I think about our values and our competencies and our mission at the Centers for Disease Control, it is clearly evident that this funding opportunity really aligned to what we were trying or attempt to achieve here at the CDC. So today you're going to hear from a variety of projects that are really aligned to our mission and values from investigators who calculated social vulnerability index to look at associations between SBI and chronic diseases and mental health outcomes to another set of investigators who are looking at burnout among frontline healthcare workers. You will hear projects that really closely support our mission and our values, not only at CDC, but also at the Centers for Preparedness and Response. And for that, that is really exciting. So let's talk about some of the program achievements. We provided more than $700,000 in this investment that provided 15 research training awards supporting nearly 70 investigators from across nearly 30 institutions, including academic institutions, on a variety of projects. And for that, that is exciting and something to celebrate for our inaugural launch of the first round of rapid response research proposals. 
But we don't want to stop there. We want to think about what we learned from this effort and apply those lessons to potential future opportunities. We wanna think about how could we leverage this opportunity to develop adaptable and scalable tools that could be used to support research in the field. We also really wanna give careful thought to the intersection of disaster response and the interdisciplinary approach to looking at disaster science and public health implications. And then we also want to look at how can this opportunity support and develop our next generation of emergency preparedness and response scientists. So that's the tall order for one initiative, but we're confident that we can achieve these goals and many, many more through this funding opportunity. So for that, I want to say thank you. It is such a pleasure. I look forward to hearing more from the projects today. This is an exciting time for the Centers for Preparedness and Response. We appreciate your efforts and thank you so very much. And with that, I'd like to turn it back over to Jennifer. Tracy, you're muted, or Jennifer, you're muted. <laughs> okay, start again. Tracy, thank you so much. That was a wonderful overview. Um, and in the interest of time and to reserve as much space as we can for the presentations about to come, I'm not going to formally introduce each team. However, I do invite you to visit our public health reports page on the Natural Hazard Center website. Katie's going to go and drop a link to that in the chat box below now. Um, and then on this page, you will find the titles, the authors, and a brief abstract of each report that is going to be presented on today. And I hope that you save this link because over the coming weeks, we have the final reports and we're getting those published online. And so all of those will be able um, available there for you to access. And so I hope you check back soon so you can download the work and really read about these preliminary findings from each group. Um, now, how this meeting is going to run is that we are splitting up into four breakout rooms uh, for presentations that are grouped together by the following topical areas. And so please listen and think about which breakout room you want to enter first. And if you are a presenter, please note which breakout room you're presenting in so you can join the correct one. In breakout room one, we will be focusing on disaster response and sheltering. Breakout room two will be education and displacement. Breakout room three will be risk communication and collective recovery. And breakout room four will be social vulnerability. And then please note that in order to join a breakout room, you must be joining the meeting via the Zoom application and not through the web browser. If you need to leave this meeting and, and rejoin via the app, please feel free to do so as soon as you hear all my comments about how this is all going to work. Uh, once I open the breakout rooms, everybody will be invited to join the room of their choice. And you can come and go through the rooms as you please if you want to watch a few different sessions across the groups. Just know that you can leave and join the groups um, on your own through the, the web browser or through the Zoom app. And so you can find the webinar schedule so you can read about which um, teams are in each breakout room on the Natural Hazards Center website. And Katie is going to also put the link to that schedule in the chat box now so you can access it. And then when the breakout room is joined, one member from each team will share their slides and give their presentations. Please go ahead and leave comments in the chat box um, throughout all of the presentations in the breakout room. And then at the end, the moderators will help to facilitate a question and answer session within each breakout room at the end of the presentations. Um, just please note, we're not going to be returning to the main breakout or to the main room as a group. We're going to stay in our breakout rooms the whole time, and then the session will end promptly at uh, 1230 Mountain Time. Therefore, I hope you have a wonderful time, that you learn a lot, that you engage with the authors who have been working so hard to get this research completed in such a short amount of time, and of course, during a global pandemic. So it has not been easy, but they have done amazing, amazing work. Um, I also want to invite everyone to subscribe for updates on our research award programs on the Natural Hazards Center webpage at hazards.colorado.edu forward slash sign up. We will be releasing a second call for proposals for the Public Health Disaster Research Award Program thanks to the continued generosity of the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention and the Natural, um, National Science Foundation. Uh, we will be releasing these award, these um, call for proposals in early September. 
And signing up via our signup page will ensure that you receive notifications about deadlines for these future opportunities for funding. Thank you all again, and please enjoy your sessions. Katie, please go ahead and open those breakout rooms. Sure, um, that, you know, that to be a part of one of the 15 funded research projects that was able to advance research in disaster, um, research in public health in the US territories that are often overlooked. My name is Kula Francis and along with my colleagues, my colleagues, Nisha Clavier and Penny Hendrickson, we studied frontline government workers in the US Virgin Islands by looking specifically at their level of burnout and quality of life following disasters. The Virgin Islands is a very small US territory that is roughly about 900 nautical miles from Miami, Florida. And due to the location of the United States Virgin Islands, the threats of disasters to the territory is significant. Located in the Northeastern Caribbean, the US Virgin Islands is in the path of many tropical weather systems and hurricanes. It is also at risk for earthquakes due to its location on the Earth's surface plates where it is less stable. Additionally, due to fault ruptures beneath the sea, the tsunami risk is higher. On September 6, 2017, Hurricane Irma made landfall in St. Thomas and St. John in the Virgin Islands, bringing catastrophic devastation with wind gusts up to 165 miles per hour. With less than two weeks in between on September 17th, Hurricane Maria destroyed most of the island of St. Croix with wind gusts up to 172 miles per hour. Entire neighborhoods were destroyed. The islands were left completely without public utility, communications. Many residents were without water, food, shelter. In some cases, residents were without power for as much as four months. The two main hospitals were deem deemed inoperable with patients having to be airlifted out of the territory as their only consequence for medical survival. Airports were destroyed. Regardless of your economic or social status, living on the islands required support and services for human existence. Still, in the process of recovery from these major hurricanes, COVID-19 introduced additional challenges to the US Virgin Islands as it completely closed the main source of revenue, tourism. Hotels, cruise ships, tourist attractions, restaurants, transportation services all suffered severe economic losses. Additionally, the introduction of COVID-19 further threatened the health and safety of the population of the Virgin Islands, many of which are considered society's most vulnerable to include children, elderly, and persons with disabilities. In the face of disasters, societies turn to frontline government workers to ensure that public services are accessible and available. Oftentimes we forget that these very same employees have undergone the same disasters and are requiring the same services and assistance as other residents. Nonetheless, after hurricanes Irma and Maria devastated the US Virgin Islands within two weeks, its citizens found themselves reliant on public personnel from an array of government agencies. As COVID-19 surfaced, these frontline employees were required to keep the adversely affected population safe and secure. Despite the threats from disasters, frontline workers of the US Virgin Islands continue to protect and secure the well being of the population. My colleagues and I conducted research that looked at frontline government workers and the level of burnout and quality of life in the recovery of, from the hurricanes Irma and Maria, as well as COVID 19. These disasters have caused havoc on the entire community. However, the community turns to the government for basic care and needs. As a result, Frontline government workers endured additional stresses during these events due to the nature of their job. Our, our research examined frontline workers from various government sectors 
of the Virgin Islands. We define frontline workers as public sector personnel who have a direct role in providing to the needs of citizens through public services. Specifically, we looked at the level of burnout and the quality of life of government workers from the following agencies and departments. They were the Department of Human Services, Police Department, Virgin Islands Territorial Emergency Management Agency, Department of Planning and Natural Resources, Virgin Islands Fire Services, Department of Licensing and Consumer Affairs, the Bureau of Motor Vehicles, Snyder Regional Medical Center, and the Governor Wang F. Louis Hospital. Based on the World Health Organization, burnout is defined as a condition occurring due to, due to workplace stress that has not been successfully managed. It is characterized by three factors. One, feelings of energy depletion or exhaustion. Two, increased mental distance from one's job or feelings of negativism or cynicism related to one's job. And three, reduced professional efficacy. The impact of burnout on public health in the Virgin Islands is significant considering that 30% of the employed in the US Virgin Islands are government workers. Of this figure, about half are frontline workers. Another major role of location on affecting burnout is the fact that the remoteness of the islands does not allow for nearby cities, states, or even countries to quickly or continually send employees to assist in times of need. Many agencies, including the Department of Health, Department of Human Services, hospitals, police departments face staff shortages. As a result of COVID-19, staff shortages have affected local budgets and operations. During a Virgin Islands legislative hearing, Commissioner of Human Services, Kimberly Causey Gomez, noted that there has been a shortage of employees to administer programs such as Medicaid and SNAP. She stated that the shortage are, the staff shortages are affecting the efforts of current staff. She, sta she stated that management staff are carrying caseloads and filling essential frontline roles that are vacant. These shortages lead to limited, much needed management, administrative oversight, policy, procedural activities, and updates that are directly affecting services, provisions, and federal compliance. The shortage can also threaten the funding of affected programs at their future implement, of their future implementations. The mounting pressures added also add with these limited workforce increases, additional uncertainties from the current and future preparation of Atlantic hurricane season, which started on June 1st and will continue until November 30th. With COVID requirements, sheltering and other emergency response units are not preparing in the event that new natural threats develop. These issues make the concerns of burnout a major one in the US Virgin Islands. The significant research questions for our study were, is there a difference between burnout and professional quality of life experienced by frontline government workers in the US Virgin Islands during hurricanes Irma and Maria and COVID-19? Is there a relationship between burnout and professional quality of life experienced by frontline government workers in the US Virgin Islands during hurricanes Irma, Maria and COVID? And our qualitative question, considering post-disaster post job experiences, what measures do frontline workers feel could have been implemented to reduce burnout or improve quality of life? To answer our research questions, we utilize two instruments, Maslach's Burnout Inventory and Professional Quality of Life Profile Survey. Based on T-tests, there was a significant difference between burnout following hurricanes Irma and Maria, and COVID-19. Based on factor score correlation of both hurricanes Irma and Maria and COVID-19, there was a strong relationship between emotional exhaustion and burnout. 
The Hurricanes Irma and Maria model showed strong relationships between emotional exhaustion and secondary traumatic stress and compassion and personal accomplishment. On the COVID-19 model, we saw moderate relationships between emotional exhaustion and secondary traumatic stress, burnout and secondary traumatic stress, and depersonalization and emotional exhaustion. The qualitative analysis yielded several emerging themes. Survey participants noted need for additional psychological and emotional support, need for additional supplies, organizational compassion and understanding, and additional time for family and rest. To quote one respondent as it related to Hurricanes Irma and Maria, Officers needed a call center set up where family members could go for assistance in making contact with employees. While on duty, there was no way to know if family was safe. Also, food supplies should be provided since there is no opportunity, especially in the face of a hurricane, to purchase food or find anything to eat. As per commentary made concerning COVID-19, one survey participant noted, Parents and grandparents are forced to choose between coming to work or risk losing their job because daycares and schools weren't open. Supervisors without children or independent children were not amenable to frontline workers who have young children. Based on our findings, we noted all disasters impacted employees. Although in different ways, Government employees are not affected by all disasters equally. Each disaster comes with its own challenges. Although agencies may have guidelines and procedures in place for disasters, they must be flexible in the manner of care and understanding of their employee situation. To minimize burnout, agencies must consider reduction of overtime and or hire additional temporary workers to minimize overload of employees acknowledge accomplishments throughout disasters if it is a necessity. Employees need to know that their work is appreciated. Offer additional channels of communication so that employees are able to convey emotions to supervisors when levels of stress seem unbearable. Resources must be invested in promoting mental health in terms of assessment and research, prevention, support, including work and family base and treatment. Agencies should create collaborations with governmental organizations in developing disaster mental health plans that ensure frontline government workers are provided with psychological and emotional support. We also suggest the creation of specialized time and locations for employees to receive necessary disaster services for themselves such as healthcare, sheltering, food, water, clothing. Although personnel allow personnel to create needs and or wish lists of services and resources needed. Again, there needs to be organizational compassion and understanding, contact with mental health direct support services, supplies, additional time for rest, as well as inspirational and motivational activities for boosting employee morale must be offered. In closing, I will end with the story of Sam the Sailor, a name mentioned by many healthcare professionals, respondents as an uplifting point of the COVID-19 pandemic. At the heightened outbreak of COVID-19 in May, 9th, May of 2020, the governor of the Virgin Islands, Albert Bryan Jr. announced in his briefly bi-weekly COVID press conference that he was relaxing his strict entry ban of a cargo ship into the Virgin Islands for one vessel in an attempt to assist a gravely ill sailor. Even more important to note is, that the, is the fact that the other major ports had denied entry of the sick patient at sea as they were in fear of putting their hospitals and ports at risk with the highly contagious COVID-19. Raleigh Tolentino, a 47-year-old Filipino spent five weeks in a medically induced coma and underwent 12 weeks of treatment at the Snyder Regional Medical Center's COVID-19 unit on St. Thomas. 
He amazingly recovered and was given the clear to return back to his native Philippines in August of 2020. His send-off was seen as a victory for all employees of the sole hospital on St. Thomas in the Virgin Islands. Jubilation filled the halls of the Snyder Regional Medical Center as he was released. It was indeed a joyous day. Mr. Tolentino stated, thank you, God bless you. I can go home to my family. As he pumped his fist from his gurney, as dozens of hospital staff chaired his recovery while the theme song from Rocky played in the background. After a final journey through the halls to hurrahs, clappings, and photos, Tolentino was loaded onto the ambulance for his medical flight back to his home in the Philippines. This is truly an example of mission accomplished. Thank you for listening. I look forward to any questions or comments at the conclusion of the other presentations. Okay, thank you so much, Kula. So if you have any questions and comments, please put into the chat box. Due to the time issue, let's move to the second one. Ivis, could you please share your screen? Yes. Thank you. Yes. Just give me a minute. <laughs> All right, found it here. Great. Can everybody see it? Yeah, perfect. Please go ahead. Well, um, excellent. Um, well, thank you so much um, for everyone for being here. Um, the title of this presentation is a health-related nonprofit response to concurrent disaster um, events in Puerto Rico. Um, and uh, I'm Ibis Garcia Zambrana, and I am a professor at the University of Utah. And I see that um, two of um, the co-PIs are here, Divya Chandrasekhar, who is also at the University of Utah, and Emil Ganapati, who is at Florida International um, University. So later on, you can direct the questions to them. <laughs> I always said that they know more about all these uh, disasters because the reason I'm involved um, now after getting my PhD and, and everything is that it affected my home of Puerto Rico. I think that that's a reason that many of us get involved. Um, and I want to also thank or um, great um, arrays that have helped us um, with this um, project. Um, so we are um, studying nonprofit organizations and why nonprofit organizations? Well, they are well positioned uh, to provide services in this under uh, context. And we know this from previous side literature that these organizations, they are very um, adaptable to um, change. They're like less bureaucratic and therefore they can be more um, agile and they can uh, make uh, responses um, uh, quickly uh, when uh, an emergency um, happens. Um, at the same time, they are very challenged by uh, disasters, but especially when you have like multiple um, disasters. And in the case of COVID, looking at public health uh, disaster um, as, as well. And the research questions that we had were like, how have nonprofits um, been affected by these concurrent and con consecutively occurring um, disasters? And how they resolve these like competing priorities, given that they have their mission and their vision, they're doing their regular work and all of a sudden something um, happens and how they adapt and how they respond um, to these um, emergencies. And we wanted to also learn, did they learn something from their previous disaster that they can apply to a future um, disaster? So whether their past and concurrent experiences have resulted in greater um, awareness and institutional learning regarding um, disaster um, preparedness. And the case study here, it's um, Puerto Rico which has faced multiple consecutive and concurrent disasters. That is the 2017 Hurricane Maria. Even though like we put in the report um, Hurricane Maria, we know that Puerto Rico was also affected by um, Hurricane um, Irma, just like the Virgin Islands and the previous um, presentation. And the 2020 uh, Southwest earthquake sequence, and then the COVID-19 um, pandemic. And so here we are also looking at a long-term uh, recovery after this um, 
different disasters. Uh, so about the methods, we um, collected data through telephone and um, because we were calling these like nonprofit organizations, we then figure out, well, a lot of people are not in the office and we have to like switch gears and do like an online um, survey of, of nonprofits. Um, we also did like uh, qualitative interviews with these nonprofits and this part is still um, ongoing. And also we just completed actually just um, gathering all the 990 um, information. We still have to analyze um, that. So that's ongoing in that sense. Um, we have like uh, 96 survey um, responses. Um, something I wanted to mention is that we also have done um, previous studies and we got a lot more people responding. So we had a lot less responses. Um, I think that we that is because of COVID-19 and this difficulty of um, finding people in, in the office. Um, the Most of these organizations were um, medium-sized organizations with an average of like 43 uh, full-time employees. And uh, we're looking at the uh, different sectors that the 990s have for the different organizations. We actually were able to cover 17 out of the 25 um, uh, NTEE sectors. And so that was like pretty good. Um, and about like 14% of our all sample of the 96 were strictly in the health sector. And so this is how they self-identify themselves in the NTEE. And um, we also asked like a question of like, how, were you like providing services um, that were directly related to the disaster? So 93% provided services during um, the hurricanes. Um, again, Irma and Maria, 64% uh, during the earthquakes. And uh, this is more geographically um, limiting or the space that was affected. So you will expect to also have less um, people being, being involved. Um, still, it's, it was uh, pretty, pretty high. And 99% um, were um, providing services related um, in a way or another to, um, to after COVID. And so we have like the interview respondent profiles, we have been able to interview 20 um, uh, people that work uh, either at the executive level or also um, field workers. So 20% were these uh, field workers and um, the rest were uh, at the executive. Um, and 57% had worked in the agency for more than um, 10 years. So you will assume that we also have more at the executive level um, responding as well. Uh, so this is related to that. And 77% uh, were um, female and all identified as Hispanic. And half of the sample was um, health organizations. So we were really trying to focus on those um, organizations. Um, so in terms of like the, the findings um, in looking at nonprofit operations, um, so here you can see what have, were the significant challenges that they have, and there's an average um, score here from zero to um, 10, and looking at the different disasters, and what we can gather from here is that um, the 2017 hurricanes and COVID-19 had more impact um, than the um, earthquakes, and we previously explained the reason of that, um, but at the same time, what is interesting is that the challenges that they had, which are the uh, listed here, bureaucratic hold, uh, hurdles, access to government assistance, access to information, managing data and all that, were um, higher um, in some uh, specific uh, disasters. Like funding was a major challenge um, in the uh, hurricanes and then bureaucracy in the earthquakes and uh, service delivery, as we might all will suspect, right, in, during like COVID-19. And um, the one thing is that is also interesting is that the, the red tape, just all the bureaucracy um, and funding emerge as like um, consistent challenges across um, all the disaster um, events. And if you know of, um, of, of Puerto Rico and um, 
this this would not be actually uh, a surprise in that in that sense. Um, so um, just thinking about their operations, we um, ask them what well, was like the the what um, was the impact of these like, multiple disasters, and do they, they had like a, a negative effect on um, the organization, employees, and volunteers, and service provision. So all of these like measures were like actually scored very high. So say they were between eight and and tens. Um, so again, this um, having all these disasters one after another, it really impacted um, these um, categories that we asked um, about. And um, here we we can see that um, like a, a, a quote of like how um, these like consecutive disasters had also had a compound um, effect. So this is uh, actually like a school and they were um, saying that um, during like hurricanes like Irma Maria, it was like very, very hard because they lost a lot of their employees. Um, they left after hurricane, uh, after the hurricane because they could not deal with the labor situation. They're not having water, not having electricity. So it was, um, this was like uh, driving people to move um, to the United States. So they lost a lot of employees. But then they, when they were like ready to hire um, more um, employees, then it was hard because of COVID and they could not find in COVID. And, and then at, at the end, um, they actually could not pay the, uh, the teachers at all um, because they were not providing their, their services in the, in the school and nobody was um, uh, working. At that time, although eventually they actually like figure out how to uh, provide like in-home assistance and, and tutoring, um, so they're they're doing much much better now. Um, and so looking here at the um, changes that these um, organizations um, had, um, so the population that they served really um, changed as well as the service provision after um, COVID, followed by like um, Hurricane Maria and then the, the earthquakes. And another big change that we saw was um, in the mission and vision after Hurricane Maria, then followed by COVID-19 and the, and the earthquakes. Um, so, oh, sorry, I kind of like jumped that, that slide. Um, so something that that we found in terms of like the response that they have um, uh, qualitatively is that the nonprofits they adapted to these like changing conditions um, and basically because they they have to right so this is kind of what they're um, es expressing that they they have to there's a new reality um, and and they were able to even though they were again uh, personally um, hurt. And they had to close certain programs and just open new ones or rethink of what was um, needed. And a lot of them talked about um, the, their mission and their, their role. And um, they always try to make connections between um, this, this new thing that we have to do it actually supports um, our mission. So something that we learn is that um, the way that they conceptualize these missions and visions are pretty broad in order to be able to also say, okay, this is what we are all about and we're just going to expand um, this, this program. Um, so, so in a way, qualitatively, they um, spoke about um about like again how how that change um happened and we we don't know yet um and this is something that we would be interested in looking at the 990s if they they might report um changes uh, from one type of organization to a different type of organization but at least what we have seen here is that again they change their missions and visions but they at the same time, try to rationalize how that was like related to what they um, were all about. Um, and so here, looking at what they learned, which was like our 
um, their questions. So we will ask them, do you like agree? Um, and the agreement on this was also very high from a to a 10 scale that previous disasters experiences uh, really helped them to prepare for short term and long term um, challenges of um, the COVID-19 um, recovery. And also we asked them, well, now that you have experienced like COVID-19, would you think that this will help you in a future um, uh, disaster um, in the short term and in the long term? And they uh, definitely agree um, with this um, as well. Um, so some of the lessons that we um, gather from all this um, data, and later on you can check out um, the report, there's a lot more um, in there, um, is that the um, organizations could make like an agile um, decision and they uh, figure out ways of like having feedback loops between the people that are working in the field and um, those are like uh, managing the organization more at the executive um, level. And they, for example, this organization was um, saying that they continuously do engagement exercises um, within their organization um, to get feedback and to see how they can um, improve um, their services. The other thing that we learn is that um, um, or organizations um, are learning from um, each other and not only from each other, but even from um, international organizations. Like this organization is saying that they have been connecting with a lot of people in um, Latin America and learning from what they're doing um, in different um, disasters and sharing um, strategies that they can then implement um, in, the, in the island. But they also spoke about how that was happening within nonprofit organizations in the island, and they specifically point to um, particular networks um, as, as well. And again, networking is a form of um, capacity building and improving their organization staff and so on. And the third learning is that, um, that they have developed um, operation plans to be able to, to respond. Um, so, so a lot of organizations now have these, um, these plans. And it's very interesting because they also like change them with every disaster. So they were thinking, okay, this is the way that we are going to manage an earthquake. And then it's like, well, yeah, that wasn't um, how we should have done it. So they figure out like new ways and they implement um, those um, changes. So in a way they got, they feel that they got better and that these plans are, um, are just uh, superior to the ones that they had. Um, as you know, a lot of them didn't have one. So that's another thing that um, we saw that they were like creating these, um, these um, plans. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much, Ivis. If you don't mind, could you please go a little bit quickly? <laughs> yeah, we're, we are like, um, um, yeah, done, when, done with the presentation. Oh, so if I could great. say like a concluding thought is that um, something that we really learn is that all these organizations that are not doing non-health work in a way are doing health work. So we should pay attention um, to what they are um, really doing. Um, and, and again, just like study it and try to understand it um, better. So thank you everyone. Thank you. Thank you so much for your presentation. Okay, let's move to the next one. Jonathan, would you like to share your screen with us? It my turn? Yeah, that's right. Oh, my internet just went out. I was <clears throat> a moment of panic. <laughs> I, missed, I missed the concluding thought. I thought we were on the edge of our seats, um, but I missed that. So I'll have to catch up on that later. No problem. Okay, so <laughs> please share your screen with us. Thank you. Great. And can you see? Yeah, perfect. Great. Uh, well, thank you. Um, 
everyone for being here today and taking the time to attend this webinar and um, hear from myself and colleagues um, in the field. Uh, it's, a, it's a great opportunity to be here and hear from each other like this in this space. Um, so my name is Jonathan Suri. I'm a project director at the National Center for Disaster Preparedness at uh, the uh, Earth Institute at Columbia University, also a doctoral student at the School of Public Health. Um, and my team members, or uh, the team members um, that are part of this project are Jasmine, Robert, Gabriella, and Jasenia. I think uh, Jasmine and Jasenia are in the room today, so say hi to them. Feel free to point any questions to them as well. Um, so our project um, is titled Co-Designing a Participatory Community Mapping Method for Informal Sheltering in Puerto Rico. Um, and so what do I know about Puerto Rico? Um, <laughs> not a ton, but uh, I have worked over there um, uh, for the last two years with Jesenia on a project called Resilient Children Resilient Communities Initiative, where we've been building community resilience coalitions to address the needs of children after disasters. Um, and I've been enhancing the capacity to do so in, in a couple different um, uh, parts of the island. And so we've been kind of intimately familiar with some of the inner workings of various government agencies and some of the challenges um, that happen at the intersection between community work um, and government agencies um, and the reality of, of what people face on a day-to-day -day basis, especially um, looking at long-term recovery. Um, and then Jasmine and Robert and I all met together through one of the, um, the COVID-19 mutual aid working groups. So this is kind of a confluence of all of our interests um, that brought us all together. Um, and so um, today I'll give you a, a a brief uh, overview of the project, um, talk to you a little bit about the cultural probe, which is a technique that we use um, to investigate our research questions, talk about some of the findings and um, overall implications. And so just to start with our research questions, um, and, and some of these again were bore born out of um, our time there um, in Puerto Rico and seeing some of these informal shelters that popped up after this earthquake swarm and at the end of 2019, 2020, um, and some of the, the questions that we had about how they were being managed, um, how useful they were, um, and um, just how, how often they were being used and utilized and their role uh, in, in community response. So we wanted to know how had individuals and CBOs been engaging and planning and planning and managing emergency shelters and what are the challenges that they may have faced in doing so? What information do community-based organizations need um, related to informal sheltering if that's a space that they wanted to engage in? Um, and based on our last presentation that we heard, uh, we know that mission creep and mission shift during a response is, is very common, um, especially for those that work in the housing uh, sector who we ended up working with. We wanted to know, can we identify and gather rich data from a community mapping exercise um, using this cultural probe technique during a pandemic, which was an application that we were unaware of, of this technique. Um, we wanted to know from that technique, could we gather sufficient information um, to locate, resource, and manage informal shelters um, during a pandemic um, and um, with this technique. And so we had some assumptions walking into this. We knew that effective information um, and knowledge management is foundational um, in achieving um, an ideal disaster recovery and response. Uh, we know that local knowledge is a key component of disaster information knowledge management, um, but we also know that it's not always um, formally and consistently integrated into formal response mechanisms. And that is due to a number of barriers, whether it's a functional barrier of people following their ESFs or whether it's something structural or social that um, uh, prevents people from interacting between different levels of government and community. Um, we knew that we could leverage existing strengths and innovations um, uh, to enhance collaboration across individuals, CBOs, and different aid agencies. Um, and doing so will all lead to a more effective and appropriate response, especially for the needs of specific communities and sub-communities. Um, and we also know now, um, as we've heard today many times already, that there are these compounding and cascading disasters, uh, which is a new normal. Um, and that is something that just can't have sporadic plans, but something that really requires a new type of planning, a new enhanced planning, new partnerships and relationships um, to help bolster um, response and make it more appropriate. Um, so just a, a quick overview of our study design. Um, all of this was conducted um, through the Columbia University IRB and approved. 
our design process, process was a mix of qualitative research as well as community-based participatory research, um, where we designed this, uh, this cultural probe in a co-design manner with a community. Um, we worked in three different regions, I'll show you in a map in a second, um, and, um, and carried out the, the research in these three communities. So to begin with, we identified three partner community-based organizations in different areas um, in Puerto Rico. Uh, we had a, a brief application process for them. Each of these organizations became a partner organization. They received a grant um, and their responsibilities were helping us recruit respondents um, and to distribute incentives. All of our interactions with them were managed by our field team, which were all locally based and all Spanish speaking. Um, all research was conducted in Spanish. Um, we, as a first step, conducted some key informant interviews. Um, we did about seven interviews with um, CBO representatives from those three CBOs and some other response organizations, public and private. Um, we wanted to know a little bit about their experience around informal sheltering, um, their perceptions about it, how they see um, how vulnerable populations are integrated into those plans, um, how those decisions are made, as well as vetting the idea of implementing a cultural probe um, with these populations that we were interested in. And we were specifically interested in three target subpopulations that we identified with the community-based organizations, and that was um, uh, populations that were elderly, caregivers of children, and caregivers of elderly. Uh, we conducted three different co-design workshops to develop these uh, cultural probes where we kind of talked about what that probe was. We walked them through a design process to identify and create activities. And then we took that information back as a research team and identified activities that we thought best matched what the community mentioned, what we thought was important, um, and um, put them all in, into a packet, which I'll talk about in a little bit here. And we then distributed that packet to um, three different communities, as all is associated with those CBOs, for a total about uh, a sample size of 30. Um, and that packet included a disposable camera, the paper packet itself, some colored pencils, a pen, and a pencil sharpener. Um, and then we were able to get everything back, um, scan digitally, and uh, we used that to examine how rich those data were, uh, the feasibility of implementing this, this process, this research method, um, the ease of use of it, um, how easy it is to translate that knowledge that we gather from those probes. And then eventually we're going to, once we finalize our analysis with everything, we'll present everything back to the communities um, and specifically to the CBOs who we hope would be engaged in this um, topic going forward. Um, the study area that we worked in ended up being the municipios of Lajas, and Juntas, and Ponce. Um, the purple dots you see on the screen are um, the 4.5 magnitude or higher earthquakes that occurred um, between the end of December and, and early February. Um, so quite a few earthquakes. And so you can see, um, I actually pulled the 2.5 and up magnitude, and there were over 1,800 separate events um, that were just too busy to even map. Um, so the cultural probe as a tool, um, why did we choose a cultural probe? We chose this partly because it was um, an appropriate tool to use based on the expertise of the team um, at the intersection of design research and participatory methodology. And we also wanted to test this novel application of this tool um, during a pandemic. Um, what was so great about it was that it was a self-administered tool. We didn't have to sit with respondents. It wasn't a typical online survey. Um, it was an ethnographic tool to gather rich um, data about a person's lived experience. And so the cultural probe is combined, composed of different activities, which may include photography, surveys, um, map drawing, um, how somebody interacts throughout their day, what they do. Um, we may ask them to journal something, take audio video recordings, write a postcard to somebody, um, construct something, um, or to annotate or draw on a map or, or diagram or something. And that's just a limit, uh, a, a small selection of what's uh, um, possible. And um, we presented many of these activities to um, the community members of the co-design process. And so that's how we kind of ended up with the set of tools that we uh, gave in the packet. Uh, we, in our report, will provide a number of other kinds of uh, probe um, methods um, that are available out there. Um, and so um, once we, um, we, we disseminated the probes to the community members um, and we got about 30 probes completed, um, in three different communities, 11 males participated and 19 females. Um, 
13 between the ages of 31 and 49, um, to eight between 50 and 64, and seven, 65 and older. Um, and the split between our subpopulations of interest included eight that were caregivers of children, nine that were caregivers of elderly, um, seven that were elderly alone, and one that was a, a dual caregiver. Uh, I'm not going to go through every single one of these activities. I could probably spend all day on that. Um, but I will show you a couple uh, that we kind of pr will present to you um, in a little bit more detail. Um, but just so you know, we asked some basic demographics. We asked people what their superpowers were and resources um, that they relied on, who uh, were the most influential people in their social network. Um, we asked them to write some words of support. So writing something to somebody that was in a difficult situation um, and words of advice. We asked people what their care routine was. If they were caring for somebody, what did their day look like? We wanted to understand how those activities might translate into um, if they were in a shelter for a long, for a long period of time, what their go bag emergency items were. We asked them to design a food menu um, in our, um, in the workshop, the, the concept of food and the topic of food came up a lot. So we could see that was important um, to many of the people there. Trusted information and sources. We know trusted messengers are, are critical in getting emergency messages out there um, and facilitating communication during a disaster. Who were they? Who did they trust? Um, we asked them to write a story or share a memory of, of a difficult time that they went through, um, remembering back to Maria or some other event and what they learned from that event they could pass on to somebody else. Information that could be useful to support mental health and well being in a shelter scenario. Um, where do people feel safe in their community? This is getting into a little bit more of the community mapping aspects. Where do people feel safe? We asked them to take pictures of those places um, and say why they feel safe there. Then we asked them to draw a community map. We asked them to identify where they live, um, where they would put a shelter, how they would get there, and any other important points of interest, as well as places um, that they would not put a shelter. And then uh, finally, designing your ideal shelter. Uh, what components or functions would you want to see in a shelter space? Um, we also just asked one brief question, which was a little bit surprising to us, the answers were at least, um, and that was, uh, had people use a shelter before and would they use one in the future? And as far as prior shelter use, only 10% said they used an informal shelter, 17% said they used a formal shelter, and 73% had never been to a shelter. Um, as far as anticipated shelter use, would you use one if there was a major disaster? 3% um, said they would use an informal shelter, 17% said formal shelter, 40% uh, said they would stay with families and friends, and 40% said they would stay in their own home. Some very interesting findings that we can have not fully unpacked yet and don't fully track with some of the other um, things that we heard. So just interesting um, contextual information. As far as support network was concerned, this is what the little page in the activity looked like, that little face and body, and they kind of put somebody's name and, and why they were um, important to them. Um, supporters that were listed were valued for their professional skills and resources as well as different kinds of emotional bond, bonds um, or you could also interpret that as different types of social capital. Um, they, they mentioned that first responders and government staff are part of their community. They didn't see them necessarily as outsiders but part of their community which was um, a really important finding um, and that of course the support network included individuals that were in the mainland and part of the diaspora. Words of support, um, you know, many of the standard things that we, we hear, um, you know, you're not alone, think positively, look to friends and uh, family and community. Importantly though, um, there was a finding to, that, that said, you know, stay busy with music, reading, board games, arts and crafts, and that highlighted an important part of um, community as well as recreation within the shelter space. And that translated into some of our other findings that we heard. Trusted messengers, you know, family, friends, other personal contacts. We heard a lot actually of people listing the CBOs that they were connected with as the trusted messengers. So again, linking back to that important connection with community organizations and response. In the community map that we had people draw, this is a, a beautiful example. Not all of them were this beautiful, um, but certainly a, a, an example of what one looked like. Um, people who live near water often said that Anywhere near water, rivers, or otherwise were not safe places to put a shelter. Um, they identified empty lots as good places for shelters, uh, as well as churches, schools, and community centers. Um, and we know Puerto Rico uses schools as their primary uh, formal shelter locations. Um, we did find that, that 
though the maps are interesting, they may not be useful to you or I, but to somebody that works in that local community, um, they may be very, very useful. And looking at shelter design, um, you know, a lot of the standard things that we'd expect to see, you know, beds, bathrooms, um, uh, food preparation areas, but most importantly, um, a lot of people talked about enhanced shelter options for entertainment and collective spaces for activities um, and accessibility for people with disabilities and special health care needs. Um, there was some mention of COVID-19 pandemic considerations, such as hand washing sta stations and special medical equipment and distancing between beds, but that was not a primary concern um, that we heard um, from, from the respondents. So as far as the methodology is concerned, um, starting this kind of research is challenging during a pandemic. Um, we have to kind of adapt um, in, in a few different ways, um, but having pre-existing relationships with community members, with partners um, that know people on the ground certainly helped, as well as understanding the context in which we were working. Remote technology such as Zoom and mural boards and mirror boards were really indispensable, as was WhatsApp. I mean, we couldn't do any of this work without WhatsApp. Um, and so these cultural probes offered a fairly hands-off approach to understanding a community's lived experience and we were able to gather a lot of information um, without having to interact face-to-face -face with people. Um, as far as shelter planning is concerned, um, we kind of approach this as a harm reduction model that people may be setting up these shelters for however, you know, whatever function they may serve, whether it's a one-time interaction or spending the night. Um, but but empowering communities to be able to do that if they're interested in doing that may um, promote their use during a disaster and get people away from unsafe situations, especially if their home is unsafe after an earthquake. Um, and there is a clear hesitance for formal shelter use. Um, shelters must address mental health, safety, security, um, you know, the medically fragile and children ensure these uh, voices are not just heard, but addressed. And the government should integrate with CBOs and community members to really understand that local context to improve planning, um, access to and provision of services and shelters. And many of the plans that we've seen there are written in a, in a silo, in an office, and don't reflect what is contextually appropriate. And as far as disaster research is concerned, um, the co-design workshops and the promote and the, the cultural probes themselves might create some agency by creating opportunities for the community to be involved in the research process and help improve plans. Um, Pre-positioning some of these relationships as well as pre-designing some of these probes may actually uh, be a, of high value after a disaster where you can just deploy them and not have to deal with face-to-face uh, -face interaction or lack of internet connection since these are all analog data collection methods. Um, and finally, um, you know, there is a strong desire for the CBOs to, in, to uh, be involved in shelter planning and decision making. Um, one really important finding was that the concept of a shelter is not just a brick and mortar facility, but it's a community hub for sharing and delivery of resources, whether that be material or social. Um, and so we hope other people will be interested in these probes um, and kind of diving into them uh, for the use and for use in other kinds of topics um, and not just informal sheltering. And finally, thank you to our CBO partners, our workshop and cultural pro participants and the research team who's awesome, as well as the Hazard Center and our funders at uh, CDC and NSF. So thank you. Oh, that's great. Great. Thank you so much, Jonathan. So next one would be Amy. Amy, could you please share your screen? There I was, I was muted that whole time. You guys can see the screen okay, right? Okay, great. Well, uh, my name is Amy Polin. I am a graduate student at University of South Florida in the College of Public Health. And today I'll just be presenting a little bit of information on what my research team and I have been doing in, uh, in Puerto Rico and the US Virgin Islands on the intersection of COVID-19 and hurricane evacuations. So just to start and to frame this talk a little bit, I'm going to give you our tagline for our research that kind of frames the importance of this, this topic in the greater scheme of things. So the pandemic increases the complexity of evacuation planning for hurricanes as social distancing is in direct conflict with human mobility and congregation that we typically see during hurricane evacuations. So just for a brief summary, the project problem was that should a major hurricane occur in either Puerto Rico or the US Virgin Islands, individuals will be forced to balance and make complex decision-making with uh, the intersection of 
trying to minimize your risk from COVID-19 with the need to potentially evacuate from a hurricane. The goal of the project was to ascertain factors that affected a residence, a residence evacuation decision making and how COVID-19 would actually play a role in that decision making process during the 2020 and 2021 hurricane seasons. And finally, the methods used in this project were two surveys conducted digitally in 2020 and 2021. The results print, um, presented here in this presentation as well as in the grant report will primarily focus on the 2020 data as the 2021 data is still being processed and written up. So why Puerto Rico and the USBI? Why do we choose to focus on this area? Well, firstly, physical vulnerability. As the other presenters in the session have alluded, there are many factors that are at play during a hurricane, including landslides, flooding, and additionally now the COVID-19 pandemic. These physical factors can cause widespread cascading public health crises, such as a loss in power, limited mobility across an island due to road closures and infrastructural damage. Additionally, there is a high level of social vulnerability within Puerto Rico and the USVI. About a quarter of USVI residents and half of Puerto Rico residents qualify as living in poverty. And having a solid economic stability and tangible resources have been shown in prior evacuation research to be critical in having a successful preparedness response and recovery to a hurricane event. So just briefly, our research questions, we had five of them. Uh, addressed how do people's risk perception, how is that affected by different demographic factors such as the ones I presented here like gender, their location, the type of housing they're in, their political affiliation, economic status, education levels, transportation, and access to a generator. What percentage of people plan to evacuate due to a hurricane event during the COVID-19 pandemic? Just literally raw numbers since this is a brand new event for people. Uh, what factors influence their evacuation behavior, and will they instead choose to shelter at their own homes instead of going to a uh, instead of going to a formal sheltering location provided by the government or by local authorities? What are the perceived barriers and facilitators that trigger an action decision making process during the COVID nineteen pandemic and during a hurricane? Are individuals likely to utilize public shelters? Uh, do people now view public shelters as excessively risky? due to concerns about COVID-19 pandemic and infection? And finally, what are the most relied upon sources of information during a hurricane event that are utilized by people living in Puerto Rico and the USVI? So the survey was conducted digitally through Qualtrics. It was offered in three languages, Spanish, Creole, and English. And the subjects of the survey were any residents that lived in Puerto Rico or the US Virgin Islands that are either over the age of 21 or 18 respectively. It consisted of approximately 70 questions, all dealing with topics that I presented in the research questions. So the study area, uh, we had a total of 470 respondents from 120 zip codes in the USVI and over 70 municipalities within Puerto Rico. Uh, to start deciding how we were going to collect data, we performed a um, hotspot analysis using the CDC Social Vulnerability Index data available for Puerto Rico. And as you can see, it was shown that the western side of the island was significantly more vulnerable than the rest of the island. So most of our targeted advertising aimed at these vulnerable populations to ensure that they were included in our final survey results. So here's a little pin board of some of the examples of how we distributed the survey. Um, you can see over here on the left, there is a graphic of one of our Facebook targeted advertisements that was put out um, in Puerto Rico and the US Virgin Islands. Uh, the survey was also hosted on governmental websites in the Virgin Islands, including Vitema's website and the Office of Disaster Recovery's website. And then we also made these uh, kind of cute infographics to put up on social media such as Twitter, Facebook, and also in physical copies that could be distributed at offices or at grocery stores, any kind of location like that, including this one, which was mostly used for Instagram and Twitter. And then this one down here, which was actually um, intended to be a physical postcard that would be handed out to participants. Um, that one wasn't utilized very much because of uh, COVID concerns for our in-person field research team. So just to briefly go over a small selection of our key results from the study, uh, the majority of the sample, so about 60%, would not evacuate for a severe hurricane and 14.2% would utilize a public shelter. This is very, very different from research done by Mara and Gladwin in 2014 that found that 
68% of people in Puerto Rico and 61% of people in the USVI would evacuate for a major storm. So literally the inverse of what we found. And that 22% and 29% of people in Puerto Rico and the US Virgin Islands respectively would utilize public sheltering compared to our number of 14.2. Individuals in Puerto Rico were more likely to say that they wouldn't evacuate compared to the US Virgin Islands. And then another consideration is that we asked about the phrasing that emergency managers use during a hurricane. And we found that that was critical. When asked if they were ordered to evacuate from a storm compared to advise, would they be more likely to evacuate? 64.4% of people agreed with that statement. About a quarter of the sample stated that it was very difficult to leave their home if they needed to evacuate themselves and family members, which is surprisingly high. An additional half of the sample said that it would be a somewhat difficult task to evacuate their, their households. So we asked about aids and barriers to evacuation to kind of complement this, this probing question. And we found really interesting um, that they very directly mirrored each other. So regarding the aids to evacuation, what we, what we asked what would make it easier for you to evacuate. We found that many people said that the access to transportation to a shelter or outside of the area of influence was important, as well as primarily a ton of people mentioned that better communications on shelter and evacuation information was critical, especially if those communications included information on COVID-19, since this was an unknown and new factor for everyone involved in the process. When asked about their barriers to evacuation or what would make it difficult for the individual to evacuate, you see, again, it was, it was very mirrored of each other. We found that a lack of information on the evacuation process or shelters would make people more likely to stay at home than evacuate limits with their transportation. If there was no way to get to the shelter, they weren't gonna go. And that there were limitations with their pets not being accepted into shelters um, widespread at the level that they thought it should be. Of note is that very few people identified COVID-19 as a barrier for evacuating, despite other results from our study showing that COVID-19 did drastically change how people decided to evacuate or not, so. And going off to that, uh, we asked a whole series of questions specifically addressing public shelter usage and the perceptions of public shelters during the COVID-19 pandemic. And we found that there is a statistically significant difference in an individual's decision to use a shelter before and then during the COVID-19 pandemic. We also asked uh, a couple of Likert scale type questions, which I'll present a couple here, but um, just to kind of exemplify this negative shelter perception. We asked, if my only option was to evacuate to a shelter in my area, I would rather shelter in place than risk being exposed to the potentially large groups inside of a shelter. 86.7% of people either said this was definitely true or probably true. And then when presented with the statement, if I was advised to leave my house during a hurricane evacuation, I think the risks of being in a disaster shelter during COVID-19 would be worse than staying at home and enduring the risks of a hurricane. Three quarters of the sample agreed with this statement. Again, showing that they felt that public shelters were much more risky than just staying at home despite whatever potential factors a hurricane could throw at them. And over half of the sample considered themselves at a greater risk to COVID-19 due to illness, like showing a, uh, a perceived risk to COVID-19, a pretty high level of perceived risk among our, our sample group. So what are the public health implications of this? Uh, this data will help emergency managers and public health planners understand how hurricane evacuation plans change with these compounding hazards of hurricane and COVID-19 and to then evaluate existing plans and account for scenario-based planning based on these results. There is also concern that many people are not making the decision to evacuate or use a shelter when they would have in the past, which could mean a potential for greater loss of life. And then finally, our kind of um, connecting thread in most of the results that we found in our research was that there's a need for improvement in public messaging and communications, such as providing easily obtained information and shelter information, um, easily obtained evacuation and shelter information, as well as making it equitable for all groups involved and making sure that it is accessible by all groups. So thank you. Um, I know I kind of sped through these results. So if you have any questions, um, please drop them in the chat. And that for future research, uh, I will also drop this link in the chat. We host a Design Safe CI page where we'll upload all of the survey instruments, all of the grant reports, all of the statistical summaries. Um, and this is where we will be up, um, uploading 
results on the 2021 survey, which included questions on vaccine, um, vaccine status effect on evacuation decision making, which little preview. Um, it doesn't seem that evacuation status is greatly influenced by if an individual is vaccinated or not. And additionally, here is our contact information for both me and then the PI on the project, Dr. Jennifer Collins. And thank you for the rest of my research team that is present in this call. Um, I appreciate everyone for coming out and listening. Great, thank you so much, Amy. That is a really wonderful presentation. Now we are open to questions section. So if you have any question, if you want, you can raise your hands or if you, you want, you can put that into the chat box. So any questions, please, for all the presenters. Is there anyone would like to ask a question? So actually, I do have a question for Kula. So especially, I'm very interested in the burnout. However, burnout is really a long-term effect or like the long-term results of mental health results, right? So how can you see like the from previous years hurricanes, their influence will affect the, the study you did and also influence on the people's mental health during the COVID-19? I'm going to turn that question over to um, my colleague, Dr. Hendrickson, Kenny Hendrickson. Uh, sorry, <laughs> can you hear me? Yeah, it's good. Uh, um, when we were doing the research, um, we uh, decided to, and um, based on if you can, if you saw on the presentation, um, we were looking at the differences between, if to see if there was a difference between burnout during hurricanes Irma and Maria um, and uh, COVID-19. And we actually found um, some differences between them, as well as we saw differences in the makeup of um, the various different uh, factors like emotional exhaustion that affects a burnout. So yeah, um, there is a big difference between um, burnout the, the burnout experience uh, during hurricanes Irma Maria, as well as the burnout um, that's affected uh, affects um, in COVID nineteen, and, and again because they're they're, they're although they're disasters, they're two different types of, of disasters. So it's it's kind of expected that you're going to experience it, as well as their specific um, uh, the frontline workers who are going to be more impacted um, with uh, in disasters uh, than than others, and, and of course with Hurricane Irma and Maria, you know uh, the disaster uh, range from destruction of their you know there's so many different uh, events that occurred uh, where hospitals were destroyed uh, and and um, police departments were overstressed and national guard. So you know there's a, a different experience between them. So burnout will affect them differently. I hope I answered the question. Yeah, that sounds great. Thank you so much. Any yeah. other questions? I saw that Jonathan asked about like the, the recording and presentations that will be available on the Natural Hazard Center's website later. So I think why is mm, when the Natural Hazard Center's team uploaded to the website and you all will receive an email. So no worries about that. You will definitely see the recordings. Oh, that is a mess. Sorry, sorry, Jonathan. <laughs> Any other questions? We do have about one minute and a half. So is anyone would like to cap this time? Okay. This is, Matt, I'll, I'll, this is Matt, I'll just reinforce. These were great presentations, really helpful. Thank you all. And Thank you for answering questions in the chat. That doesn't always happen. Oh, thank you so much, Matt. Actually, I saw a lot of good discussion into the chat box. So please keep going. Great. OK, uh, thank you so much for all the presenters and also for the participants. I hope that we all learn a lot from those amazing presentations. And uh, hopefully, you have a good rest of your day. OK, see you later. Bye bye in the face of the impact of disasters, which in view of the report just published by the United Nations on the irreversibility on environmental impacts 
of global warming represents now the central issue to be addressed by humanity at the planetary level. Never before a meeting like this has been so important. We would also like to acknowledge and thank the fellow research assistants who helped us through this research process. Uh, that is Jaira Lopez, Karina Rosario, Nahuale Morales, and Wilmari Quinones. And we also want to say hi and greeting, greetings to our chancellor of the UPR at Macao, Dr. Aida Rodriguez, uh, where we conducted the study, uh, Dr. Ubalo Cordova, Vice President, and Dr. Mayra Olavarria, President of UPR System, for their interest in this research presentation. Thank you very much. In less than three years, university students survived multiple disasters, Hurricane Irma and Hurricane Maria in 2017, earthquakes in 2020, and the COVID-19 pandemic that had adverse effects on their personal and academic, academic lives. Notwithstanding, there were students who continued their studies and managed to complete their bachelor's degree. The objective of this study was to explore the protective factors that allowed students to successfully complete three to four years of college while confronting a series of disasters in addition to sustained poverty in their communities. This research was conducted with undergraduate students at the University of Puerto Rico at Macau. The research was guided by the following questions. How did the students successfully complete their academic studies while confronting disasters? Why, which protective factors have sustained them? Which of them, these did they identify as most important? And what other protective factors could reduce the emotional impact caused by disasters? Our research approach was methodological triangulation. We compare and integrated different sources of sociodemographic information and recent research with participant testimonies through surveys, in-depth interviews, and focus groups. The methodological triangulation was based on each individual's summary of results so that we could observe and analyze the findings each provided about their socioeconomic and academic living conditions their perceptions and attitudes toward life and adverse situation, their testimonies of how they face disaster while studying at the university, and their reflections of, of what worked and what should change. This methodology offers us a more complex view of the practices that students use to continue their education rather than the repeatability of the observational findings. We use protective factors as the unit of analysis to better understand how students manage the impact of three different disasters. Our, in our findings, we observe that students live in historically precarious conditions with little or no governmental support. Their families, churches, classmates, and even some professors or, or counselors, sometimes in equally precarious conditions, have accompanied them to survive and remain active and motivated. Unsurprisingly, they have been able to embrace very assertive and tenacious postures. They have been persistent and optimistic as a way of coping with hardships they have experienced long before disasters struck. In short, they have been assuming the narrative that staying and finishing colleges uh, seems to be their call to get ahead. We were able to observe these protective factors from the individual level with this internalization and be reflected in their collective behavior. For example, in the identifying with other classmates in the same situation, supporting and seeking support in their neutral circles, establishing empathy practices with professors and other sectors that face the same situations. There was a sense that the collective has great value and that maintaining an attitude of not leaving anyone behind enhances their character and their will to move forward. We saw how in the focus group, the core of the achievement was emotional support networks, empathy and cooperative attitude. They praised and recognized the value of their families, friends, people at the university and in church as essential supports. They also overflow with recommendations and proposals to prevent, strengthen, transform, 
and sensitize the university according to their felt needs. In short, we sought in the administer, administer instrument diverse contents and simultaneously, simultaneously they inform the context and the experiences that they have influenced the protective factors that gave him greater inherent and adaptive resilience. After analyzing the data, the team concluded that team concluded that the key finding of this study was empathy as the fundamental factor that allows students to continue their academic students. students. Empathy originates from the Greek empathos, which could be translated as being affected or doing with the affected. It was not only an understanding of the situation experienced by the other. Empathy is also a skill that allows us to pause our own needs to create a capacity to respond to the true needs of the affected person. Empathy is a skill that allows creative and innovative initiative to be carried out when faced with disaster situations. In this study, social binding understanding with the other was based on several factors. One was living in the same situation as the affected person, for example, family, classmates. And another one is that students also distinguish the help of some professors and university staff for their ability to step outside, establish norms to rules and create support mechanism for them. As seen in the figure, uh, we are sharing about the triangulation of protective factors. We highlighted tyrannies, inherent and adaptive resilience. Inherent resilience regarding potential and adaptive resilience regarding activation of social potential. Throughout the service result, we saw that the students mentioned a high capacity of inherent factors that allowed them to adapt and manage their academic studies in disaster situations. However, to manifest this inherent capacity, it had to be activated. That element of activation was found in the support networks, networks that the students expressed, which became the social capital that allowed them to manage their emotions, generate concentration in, the, in their students, create changes in the organization of time and space and support each other academic tasks. In that sense, empathy practices as an element of resilience also allows students to develop social capital and to create support networks. The type of social capital that developed using Turnist typology was bonding social capital that refers to the elements of integration between members of existing support groups. However, from the conceptual uh, framework on capitals, Bourdieu mentions that the capitals management creates embodied and objectified practices. The distinction between the two refer to practices that were embedded in everyday actions and practices that have become institutional policies. In our research, we found that social capital based on empathy practices that promoted the resilience of university students was embedded in the individuals who managed to reinvent ways of helping and supporting each other. The ability to place oneself in the same place as the students was the condition, as Bourdieu himself mentions, that not only allows the concertation of practices, but also the practices of concertation. When discussing the theoretical framework, we assume, along with Tierney, that if disasters are social products of their effects, are linked to political and economic conditioning, resilience becomes a confrontation with the powers that make populations vulnerable. One of the effects of the power is individuation and the attempt to dismantle the, coll the collective actions that sustain populations' empathy. Resilience then becomes a confrontation with the power that has turned politics in, in the words of Clara Valverde, into necropolitics. The capacity of empathy to increase resilience is a way of counteracting th that kind of politics. To summarize, 
some of the implications for public health practices. We can state that the government, the universities, and communities need to agree on policies, as well as the responsibility of various institutions to minimize the collateral damage caused by disasters, especially post-traumatic stress associated with abandonment, disorientation, and neglect by insensitive bureaucracies. Empathy practices should be part of the plan. Some implications for establishing public health and disaster work policies are planning relationships. It was necessary to plan and create spaces for social interaction that allow the creation of trust networks for listening, talking, and mutual support. Ability to emphasize, we must create conditions and trainings for empathy practices during disaster. This will consist of training for listening, for attentiveness, and for mutual understanding, and support of the diverse situation experienced in disasters. Space for non-institutionalized action, the space for creativity. Conditions must be created so that citizens know they have the possibility to act creatively outside the normal institutional frameworks. Moratorium. Institutions should put a hold on requirements, tuition, payments, and deadlines when disasters occur. There are just some of the implications that we know can help transform public policy for all these sectors with whom we need to work in collaboration. Part of our community is and will be to, be sh to, to share this result widely uh, to strengthen disaster management plans, especially in the areas of health and mental health. Again, thank you all for this space and briefly share uh, our uh, findings and the opportunity to continue to reinforce these contributions. We welcome your feedbacks. Uh, muchas gracias and Ubuntu, soy porque somos. Muchas gracias. Thank you so much, Maria. And please, if you have any questions for Maria and her team, please put that in the chat box and I'll keep track of that. And then we can ask Maria questions at the end. Um, now we're gonna move on to the second team. The name of this report is the effect of social services, disruptions on educational outcomes following consecutive disasters in Puerto Rico. Um, Eileen, are you the one that's going to be presenting today? Yeah. Okay, perfect. Go ahead and share your slides now. We'll get started. Okay, here we are. Well, first of all, thank everybody for being here. Our research, as Jennifer just said, is titled The Effect of Disruption of Student Educational Outcome Following Consecutive Disasters in Puerto Rico. Um, the main objective of our project is to describe how a school interruption caused dis by disaster affected student academic achievement and educational outcome, especially among vulnerable populations. And there we're emphasizing on student living under poverty and student with disabilities. The project has two parts. I'm gonna be concentrating on part one, which is the quantitative analysis of administrative data obtained from the Puerto Rico Department of Education. A second part of the study is a qualitative analysis based on interview with school personnel. So I'm gonna start with the description of that third part of the study, which is the one included in the upcoming report. So we posed three main questions. The first question was whether or not the, the vulnerability profile of students have changed during the last few years in Puerto Rico as a consequence of the disasters. Um, the second question is whether uh, Hurricane Maria affected academic achievement and we measure in academic achievement through the standardized test scores. And we want to know if that effect varies according to the vulnerability profile of the student, once again, focusing on poverty and student with disability. And lastly, we look at the effect of both Maria and the earthquake sequence of 2020 on the probability of dropping out of school. For this first part of the study, we use data from 
the Student Information System of Puerto Rico's Department of Education and at the individual level. So that includes variable on the student's socioeconomic characteristic, under a standardized test result, their, the presence of disability, and also it included information on exit codes that allow us to identify those students that drop out of the system. During the period, we're looking at data from 2016 to 2021. Our identification strategy relies on comparing students that were enrolled in the municipality most affected by the disaster versus those students that were enrolled in the municipality least affected by the disaster. So we classify for all students enrolled on September 2017, we classify them in three groups. Those enrolled in municipalities that receive high, medium, or low damages from Hurricane Maria. Likewise, for student enrolled by December 2019 in the public school system, we classify them in three groups depending on whether they were enrolled in municipalities that receive high, medium, or low damages as a result of the earthquake. And the information of damages come from of uh, those reported to FEMA. In terms of an analy analytical tool for our analysis, we use, in the case when we are studying the effect of Hurricane Maria on academic achievement, we use two approaches. One is a difference in difference approach that compared a, the three groups that I just mentioned, and the other is a propensity matching in score, which also allows to, com to make the comparison between groups to look at the effect of both the earthquake and Hurricane Maria on the probability of dropping out of school, we use a duration analysis framework. So right away, I'm gonna to go to our findings. First of all, in terms of the vulnerability profile of the population in the public school system in Puerto Rico, we have to point out that 80% of them live in families with income below the poverty level, and almost 30% of them present at least one learning related disability. When we join both sources of vulnerability, we think that 25% of one quarter of the student population reported both. They are impoverished and they have at least one learning disability. When we look at trends over time, we do see a U-shaped trend in the poverty levels. Poverty among student population in Puerto Rico was decreasing previous to Hurricane Maria but then it started increasing after the hurricane and that increase is more noticeable in those municipalities that were highly impacted by Maria. So we concluded that we do see an increase in poverty among the student population that we can relate to the hurricane. In terms of disability, we don't see uh, significant changes in the percentage of students that present disability through time. We do see small differences in terms of the type of disability that um, they're reporting. When we look at the effect of Hurricane Maria on achievement, we do find a moderate but significant decrease in the standardized test score when we compare those students in the highly impacted municipality versus other groups. When we include in the analysis a variable that take into consideration the length of the school interruption, meaning the, the number of days that the school was closed, which vary from one school to the other, some of that difference is explained, but it's not eliminated. Meaning that the length of school interruption is one important variable in describing why uh, academic achievement is affected by disaster, but it's not the only one. There are other elements associated by the disaster that are um, reducing academic um, test scores. Another important finding is that we do see a stronger effect among those students living in poverty or students with disability. And that's true not only for the students in the most affected municipalities, but also for those students who were enrolled in municipalities that receive a medium impact from the disaster. Additional to that, we look at a specific group of students that were enrolled in 22 schools that closed permanently due to the past of year the passing of Hurricane Maria, and we do see a large decrease in relative academic achievement when we compare the change in academic achievement pre and post Maria for those groups versus the rest of the student population, we do see a large and significant increase, decrease in academic achievement for those students that were displaced. 
looking at dropout rates, in that case, we look at trends in dropout after Maria, and we also look at trends in dropouts after the earthquake. We look at two cohorts for each case, eighth graders and 10th grader for Huracan Maria. We look at eighth grader and 10th grader that were enrolled um, on September 2017. And for the earthquake, we look at those students who in 2020 were enrolled either in, in 2019 enrolled in either 10th or eighth grade. And then for each case, we compare uh, among, within the cohort, we compare those students who were in the most impacted, medium impacted or least impacted municipalities. After Maria, we found that for those eighth graders in those municipalities that received a medium impact from the hurricane were the one that shows a higher increase in the probability of dropping out of school. For those students, the, the dropout hazard risk is 18% than for students in the most impacted or least impacted municipalities. When we look at eighth grader after Maria, contrary to expectation, we see that those in the most impacted municipalities are actually the ones that are less likely to drop out of school. Following the earthquake, when we do the comparison among eighth graders, we see that we do find a significant increase in the probability of dropping out of school for eighth graders in municipalities most affected by the earthquake compared to other groups. In fact, their hazard risk is twice as those for eighth graders in least, the least impacted municipalities. Among eighth graders, we found that the risk of dropping out of school is higher for those that were enrolled in municipalities that received a medium impact from the earthquake. So we concluded two main things out of this analysis. First is that the negative impact that we will expect from disaster on the probability of staying in school is more evident among eighth graders than among 10th graders. And the other thing is that we find that in many occasions, those students in the medium impact municipalities are more affected than those in the most impacted municipalities. And we think that that may be related to the fact that a lot of the time the health, the services concentrate on the most impacted areas and not necessarily on other areas that, although are not the most impacted, they do receive a negative effect from the disaster. We identified three main areas of, implication, of public health implication from school disruption. One has to do with the capacity of families to fulfill basic living needs. We know that one of the main sources of nutrition for children are school lunches. So when the school is interrupted, the capacity of the family to fulfill those basic needs are limited. Another area has to do with mental health. We know that during the mental, during disaster, mental health needs increase. And when the school is closed, the capacity to attend to them is reduced because many times those needs are assessed and services are referred through the school system. And finally, another important aspect is that this disruption also causes a student with disability to lose access to many important services that include assessment, referrals, and therapies that are hit basically and just um, set through the education system, also mainly provided by private providers. That takes me to our actionable recommendation that are geared to limit or reduce the amount of school disruption caused by disasters. The first one is that it's important for every school to have an active and engaged committee with a diverse representation of the school community, the local community, nonprofit, local government, and in order to coordinate emergency response and be able to respond immediately after a disaster. Another very important implication is that it is important to establish emergency plans with private providers of special education services to reduce or eliminate interruptions. One is since we experienced in Puerto Rico during the pandemic is that therapies for a student with disabilities in many cases were suspended for almost a year. 
and I, I will say probably in most cases for students in the public education system. Uh, so we know that these students need a special attention and somehow we have to make sure that their services continue even if the school is closed. Another important thing is to establish protocol that allow personal, the school personal to visit student at home after a disaster so that they can assess the well-being of the student and report back to the school emergency response team. That's probably the more direct and efficient way to um, help the community right after a disaster. We also recommend that every school is equipped with water tanks, solar panels, batteries, so that they continue to operate, they can continue to prepare food and serve as support for the students and family in the community in general. We do see the school at that center of service for the community during disaster. And I think that's an important um, role that the school should fulfill. Therefore, it is important to promote supportive school environment where students and family feel safe and care during and after a disaster. That goes hand in hand with the need to allow directors at the school level to make decisions about disaster preparedness and emergency response at the school so they can react quickly, the school can react quickly and can react, and can react according to the needs of the community. They don't have to wait for the central office to be directed that many times do not relate to what's really happening at the local level. And finally, we recommend to design and implement curricula for each grade level to promote a better understanding of natural hazard and develop social responsibility among students and their family. But it's important to focus on risk mitigation to make sure that looking to the future, we're in a better position to confront other events that may occur. So this is our presentation. I'll be glad to answer to questions at the end. Thank you very much. Thank you, Eileen. That was a great presentation. So much to think about. Um, next up, we have um, an, our team with Leonard Huggins and Ted Sorant um, with the title of Long-Term Impacts of Cascading Disasters in the U.S. Virgin Islands on Student and Teacher Mental Health. Uh, Leonard, would you like to share your slides? Sure. Can you hear me clearly? I can hear you perfect. Okay, let's try this. I tried earlier, but he told me I couldn't, so let's see. Can you see my screen? I can, yes. I don't okay. see your slides yet, but I, oh, there we go. Okay. Okay, can you see that now? It looks perfect, thank you so much. Okay, well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, or good morning, depending on where you are. It's afternoon where I am. Um, we are very excited to be able to present to you findings from our study exploring the long-term impact of cascading disasters in the Virgin Islands, particularly on high school students and teachers, mental health and resilience. Today I'm presenting on behalf of Ted Cero, who is also in the chat, who is our, one of our co-investigators in this project. And um, also we would like to also thank our online assist, on island assistant, Morella Duo, who also helped us in some of the coordination in St. Thomas. So I'll just jump right in and start um, giving you some updates. So just to give you a brief summary. So you've heard from Eileen about Hurricane Irma and Maria, but these two hurricanes devastated the USVI in 2017, and they were just two weeks apart. They were both category five hurricanes when they impacted St. Thomas. So three years later, we look at the situation and we still have schools that are still housed in modular units and we have homes, some of them for students and teachers that continue to be um, covered with blue tarps. And of note, you have situation later on in the years over this period of time where we had schools that were not initially condemned or buildings that were not initially condemned being condemned at different stages. For example, um, at the Charlotte Amali High School in 2018, we had 18 classrooms that was condemned in a building. And then 
in 2019, another 10 classrooms and eventually the entire, one of the entire buildings of that school was condemned. So that is still a process ongoing. So we really wanted to ask, you know, how are students and teachers doing now in terms of the longer term aftermath? It's been three and a half years, almost four years now. So our research questions really focus on what are the key stressors to those students and teachers. And we also looked at to what extent does these long-term stresses um, of the disasters impact student well-being and graduation outlook. We also looked at how do the students and teachers cope in the longer term. And then we kind of added this based on impact kind of later on in the study as we went on, but just look at how um, COVID-19 pandemic impacted the teacher's thoughts and feelings and outcomes compared to that of the hurricane. So just to give you a quick look, the two public high schools that we have, and if you could see my mouse moving around, um, Sala Damali High School and Ivana Yudora Keen High School. Ivana Yudora Keen High School is kind of a semi-urban, semi-rural type school, but it also accommodate students from St. John's, which is a neighbor, a neighbor in Virgin Islands. So for our groups, our study groups, we looked at students, uh, only juniors and seniors, because we wanted people who were either approaching high school at that time or were in high school. If we looked at any other group, they would have been either already graduated or probably have a whole different situation in terms of entering into the high school and the conditions there. So we just looked at people who were eighth and ninth graders at the time. And we looked at teachers who, who were currently teaching in the high schools because they would have impacted the recovery of some of the students. So if you look at really our sample, we had mostly females, almost twice as much female students as male students and the same for teachers. Overall, we had 68 um, students who uh, answered our survey and 38 teachers. Predominantly, the African Americans, um, the teachers is a little bit more diverse in that they had um, a few more white, Hispanic, and Asian Americans. So, just an idea about the study site itself and some of the statistics over the past decade so that you get an idea of the impact of what the hurricanes did. Um, basically, there was declining enrollment in the schools. However, as you see in those graphs, both side by side, one for the rural, one for the urban type setting. In 2017, there was a drastic drop in enrollment by grade, and that never really recovered up until this point. At the same time, below, there was a significant dropout rate. And again, a lot of that was explained because there was a lot of out migration or immigration from the island itself, and a lot of those students did not retain return to the to the islands. Generally had a rough split between 50% male, roughly 50 to 50, or 52% female to 48% male. So our process of data collection, we, we did document, you use DocuSign, we sent out forms, we did all of our surveys online because schools were operating in a virtual environment and we did, we did recordings and interviews, follow-up interviews, students and teachers, and we recorded those on Zoom and transcribed them in order. So there are two, three instruments, key instruments that I'll highlight. One to check for PTSD, which is really a 17 item measure that measures these three concepts, avoidance, re-experiencing re hyperarousal. Avoidance is like um, decisions that try to avoid certain decisions. Your experiencing is more like flashback, nightmares, and hyper arousal, like angry outbursts or, you know, irritability, things like that. So we measured that on a scale. We measured risk resilience with also all on scale negative bias, emotional resilience, and social skills, and then coping strategies. The single items such as you know religion or active coping. So here I'll proceed to discuss our findings. So for post-traumatic stress disorder, we found that 22% of the students overall still are still experiencing post-traumatic stress even three and a half years after the hurricane struck. In that 
This is more common among female, 30% of the female compared to only 5% of male students actually addressed, indicated that. The one, the two things that were most significant is in terms of these subscales really is avoidance and re-experiencing. In, in, in other words, they weren't really getting irritable or angry at first. They were just trying to make decisions to avoid um, dealing with it or they were just having some flashbacks or memories and those type of, those are types of the symptoms. So we found some significance and strong correlations amongst our, um, when we did our analysis and we want to highlight just, just one in particular, which was pretty critical. And that's the one you see in red, who those who had to relocate where is highly significant, 32% of a correlation, correlation, um, coefficient here, which indicates that people who had to, or students who had to relocate had a higher tendency to have lingering PTSD. And again, those two was one of avoidance and one of um, re-experiencing. When we checked on resilience, we found out also that um, they had fairly low negative bias in terms of resilience, whatever the resilience is of 13.4, but that the positive or regulatory responses, which are the higher emotional re resilience and the higher capacity to engage socially, those were much higher, which meant that the students were more resilient. And in order to do that, they use coping strategies. Their coping strategies that they employed most, the top five I've listed to the right are really acceptance, sense, self-distraction, active coping, positive reframing, and religion. Those ranked uh, midway, if you look at the possible range that they could, those scores could have had is two to eight, and you could see acceptance was just above most everything else. They just accepted the situation, and that's culturally something that we found out as well. One thing we wanted to know this is not shown is like behavioral disengagement, venting and self-blame also tend to rank high. And for society that's um, fairly religious, it um, that was what those things rank higher for the students above religion. So we wanted to point that out. For the teachers, we also found that a high percentage, actually 30%, just like the in females, still experience post-traumatic um, stress disorder and that they had the same um, subscales avoidance to re-experience in being the issues that they experience most. One thing to note for the teachers is that they like no negativity bias, uh, they're less sens hypersensitive to stress than the students and they were higher in terms of their emotional resilience and capacity to engage socially which which meant Probably, probably they're more mature, so they knew how to deal with this and, and probably um, dealt with it different than, than compared to the teachers. And noticeably here, religion ranked number one for the teachers. And then the same four um, coping strategies for the students. So the takeaways that we really want to share for this part is that on the school district level, we think um, Really, we should, the school district should provide more systemic training to teachers in order to help them to re help students recover. We found in a lot of our interviews that teachers, uh, students were more reluctant to go to counselors, especially in the longer term. And so they would probably use their music teachers and so forth to express how they're feeling. But and then that only certain teachers had like recovery or type training. And so we, we think if it is spread across more of the, all teachers, all assistants, administrators, that they will be able to be more effective with students even before referring them to counselors. Also found that um, one of the things is that there's not an ongoing evaluation because students tell, tends not to self-report. So we, the, the district, and the schools will probably have to find ways to institute more ways of, of getting back from students how are they performing in terms of their own emotional health. On the parent side, we felt that parents particularly need to go beyond um, accepting what has happened and just provide some other positive reinforcement of uh, active coping for the children because people who are dislocated or the students who were tended to be have 
deal with behavioral disengagement and self-blame rather than some of the more positive type of coping strategies. Also, we found out that um, one of the other things that we, we will encourage parents to do is really to more aggressively pursue repair and rehabilitation of their homes after such disasters because it seems as if those people who were located, relocated or had repairs to do were the ones who experienced a lot more of these longer term PTSD and so forth. In terms of the community and, and disaster recovery, we, we strongly encourage the same instrument to be done um, for by the organizations where they could assess really student health in the longer term because we've also found in this study that really roughly one in five students continue to have PTSD even four years after the disaster. Um, next, we'd like to then to also prioritize health assistance for students. And I talked briefly about that before, especially those who are dislocated because those are the ones who seem to have stronger reaction and PTSD uh, symptoms associated with them longer after the disaster. And finally, to really develop and provide more recovery training that I mentioned, help assist schools and district to provide that recovery training. And on the government side, really to incorporate a lot more perspective from students and teachers in their recovery plans, and also to deal on, allocate more resources to those students and teachers who are displaced from their homes. So finally, I just want to pinpoint some of the things that we think for future research directions. Really, we want to, we think we should look at some sort of com comparative study between, you know, parents and high school students' reaction to disasters and how we could really validate in more detail their responses and determine more actions that could be taken um, in terms of care. And then, further to build on our study really to look at ways where you could measure and assess the counseling programs at school institute and see the effectiveness and how to really stretch them into the longer term. And finally, because our sample size was not as big as we wanted it to be, probably larger sample size will help us really to determine if this, what's the real true impact on student educational performance rather than just what they have told us to date, but also to look at more of the sensitive type data. So in closing, I just want to thank again, Marla Lador, online assistant, of course, my co-investigator, Ted, and the principals of both schools, Alicia Liedem and April Petrus, and also the Virgin Islands Department of Education and several folks there who really helped us to coordinate and to get this completed. And of course, our sponsors and our team from Lori and Jennifer, NSF and the CDC. So thank you all. And we really appreciated being able to participate in this, in this grant opportunity. Wonderful. Thank you, Ted, or Leonard, <laughs> sorry. Um, you could just stop, stop sharing your screen. I'm trying, okay, there we go. <laughs> okay, awesome. Thank you so much for that. Um, our next presentation is titled Real-Time Migration, Tracking to Puerto Rico After Natural Hazards Events. And we're gonna shift a little bit from schools to um, displacement now. So go ahead, Alejandro, and share your slides. Okay, can you see my, my slide? Yes. Perfect. Okay, thank well, you. thank you. Um, so, you know, it's, it's estimated that disasters account for the displacement of uh, 30 million people in 2020. So, you know, the public health consequences of migrations are, are really significant, um, but still the data to track international mass migration is considered flow and limited. Um, so my name is Alejandro Arrieta. I'm from Florida International University, and I am representing a multidisciplinary team of computer science, social scientists uh, from FIU. And in our uh, team developed a tool to track migration to Puerto Rico after a, a natural hazard event. And 
So let me uh, tell you what is, uh, what, why do this tool, right? Um, so basically this is relevant for Puerto Rico and the Caribbean in general, because uh, people from the Caribbean are three times more likely to be displaced by disasters. And, and we know that the public health um, need to track immigration flows in terms of um, you know, um, organizing resources, allocating resources, um, and the different consequences in physical and mental health of immigrants in their transit to their new, new country. So wh what are we doing? How are we doing this tool? And behind the tool is the idea that uh, immigrants remain connected. Um, their cultural identity takes for you know for additional years after they move to their new to the new uh, geographic area and and they are connected nowadays mostly through the internet either through connecting through their you know friends and family through social media or just uh, looking at news websites from their own country knowing you know what's going on in their original country so in, in that regard, they have, um, you know, they, they leave a digital trace, right? And, and, and there is a common digital trace between co-nationals living in the, in the home country and those who immigrate to other countries. So just to put an example, um, you know, in, in immigrants from the Dominican Republic, uh, they probably are looking for the same type of information when they are in Puerto Rico or in the in continental US, they are looking for the same type of information that people in Dominican Republic are looking for. So uh, there is a commonality there that we want to exploit to develop this tool. So what are we doing? Uh, we are looking at immigration flows to Puerto Rico. And in this case, Puerto Rico, from an immigration perspective, a language perspective of immigration is the host area. And, and we are looking for immigrants from Dominican Republic. That means the source country, right? Those who move from Dominican Republic to Puerto Rico. And we are exploring uh, one particular event, which is the Hurricane Matthew and flood events in the Dominican Republic that you know, affect Haiti and the Dominican Republic actually in between October, November, 2016. So we are looking at that to you know, kind of validate our study. We have two research questions. Uh, our first research question is, if, is, is it feasible to use internet data to measure migration flows to Puerto Rico from other, you know, other countries? Right? So that's basically a more uh, methodological uh, goal. Um, and we want to see if it's feasible. And, and the second question is the immigration flow variable and you know if we can get an indicator from this method that we call the migration flow variable and we want to know if this variable is valid in, as a real-time measure of present migration right so we want to compare with other data and see if it's you know valid and makes sense so uh, for the first question we have you know, this idea of feasibility and it's actually developing the methods, right? And as I mentioned before, with that example, what we want to do is to look at what people, again, in the example of Dominicans, for example, what Dominicans are looking for on the internet um, when they are in Puerto Rico or where they are in, in you know, New York or in any other place, in this particular case in Puerto Rico. But we want to look at things that are specific to Dominicans that can help us to identify Dominican Republic citizens in other places. So to that end, we create a first step, uh, trying to get what are those keywords that are specific to the Dominican Republic. So what we call a country specific keywords from the source country, right? And so those, are, they, those have to be keywords that are unique to Dominican Republic and different to, you know, the keywords that are searching other similar countries. And we look at, we have two approaches. First, we look at news. I mean, actually we look at news in, in, in both approaches, right? But news on business, politics, sports, entertainment. 
in the first approach, we look at the websites, right? Like online news. And the second approach, we look at Twitter uh, that are used for these news uh, websites. You know, as you, as you see, many of these websites now, not only they post the news in the website, but they also tweet the news um, and using Twitter, of course. So we are looking at all these type of news. Uh, of course, some news, business, politics, sports are common, right? Not only from the Dominican Republic. So if, especially now, if you're looking at the Olympics, you can search for Bolt in different places, not only in Dominican Republic. So we are looking for those that are specific to Dominican Republic. And for that end, we compare the search searches, the main searches in the Dominican Republic with searches in Cuba, Colombia, Venezuela, and Panama, Spanish speaker countries. We did the same for Creole and English. But in this example, and in this, uh, in this report, we are talking about the Spanish speakers, uh, Dominican Republic. And then we just exclude and say, okay, what is common? What is unique to Dominican Republic that you don't see in Cuba, Colombia, Venezuela, and Panama? Okay, so we use a process there, looking at the websites and Twitter, um, what we found is that the website have several limitations. So at the end, we just focus on Twitter. The main, the main limitation is basically history. We cannot track keyword search two years ago on the websites, but Twitter records everything. Um, so we start with a, you know, processing the data, collecting a bunch of, you know, a lot of uh, keywords. Uh, from Twitter, and, and we use some applications, and that's the you know the computer science people in our team. That's those are the ones that you know explore all these, identify names. For example, uh, like my name Alejandro Arrieta should be collected in just one name and not split into two. Um, name of cities also. Puerto Rico should be just one word: Puerto Rico, and not Puerto and Rico. Right, and, and so th those kind of um, you know work and processes, then we remove punctuations, numbers, etc., and came out with keywords for keywords that can be classified as a, a geographic keywords, names, um, and and those are the ones that we use to find the country specific keywords. The second step, once we have those keywords, is to well look at what you know, those are the, the specific keywords. Are, are these keywords being searched in Puerto Rico? That's the question. And so we use Google Trends, uh, which is based on Google searches, to extract search volumes in Puerto Rico uh, of, for each of the country-specific keywords that we identify from the Dominican Republic. Okay, so here we have a weekly trend that range from 2006 to, you know, nowadays, in, in this particular case, we use a, a short period of time. And, and we are, thanks to Google Trends, we are able to look that not only on historical data, but also real time. And it, it can be done for basically large cities in the world. In the case of Puerto Rico, we couldn't find these two smaller areas. So we did for the whole island, Puerto Rico. And again, we extracted um, thousands, right, just for Dominican Republic, more than 2,500 keywords that are specific to Dominican Republic, but they were searched in Puerto Rico. And, you know, on this long trend, weekly trend for each of these 2,000, more than 2,500 keywords. Okay, so once we have this step two, well, the question is, okay, how can we deal with this big number of keywords? And that's the step three. The step three basically tries to look at what is common among all those keywords, right? Because you can see keywords that are looking for sports, for entertainment, for an actor, for a city, but uh, those won't tell you that somebody is from Dominican Republic, like, you know, alone. If somebody searched for an actor from Dominican Republic, that necessarily doesn't necessarily mean that you are, you know, from Dominican Republic. But if we collect all these, if we extract a common factor for all these two thousand terms, then we think that we are, you know, capturing 
um, that dimension, right? That uh, commonality between Dominicans in Dominican Republic and Dominicans in Puerto Rico. So for that, we use uh, what is called a dynamic factor model, which is a time series econometric method uh, technique that is uh, that allow us first to obtain this common factor that is unobserved. Of course, we don't see that factor, right? Uh, but it, it allows to observe, obtain an, an, an observed common factor. And the other thing is that it can reduce the large dimension of keywords, more than 2,000, to just one factor, that common factor. So we, do, we did that for Dominican Republic. We call it the migration flows variable. Again, that's a common dynamic because it's temporal every week. Right, and that explains variations in all in all keywords together. Right, and we hypothesize that is is correlated to migration flows that you know are mostly unobserved, at least at that frequency of weeks. So that is our, stra our strategy, and 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 then you know we move to the rest. The next research question is: Can we use these migra migration flows variable that we estimate? And, and is that a valid, um, you know, variable to measure migration flows? So, um, so that's the validity, and and that tells about our results also. So, how can we compare this variable? The the best alternative that we have is the census data, which is not actually the best, but it's you know the best what the best we have. Uh, in particular, the American Community Survey is an annual data. It asks about you know immigration. If you in, immigrate to this to Puerto Rico in the last year, in the last five years, etc., and from where, so we know that from there who immigrate you know in Puerto Rico from Dominican Republic, but it's still limited. It doesn't capture illegal immigration, for example. Uh, it's annual. So there are some um, constraints there, but but that's what that's you know the only thing we observe, and most research trying to predict migration use census data as well. So um, then we analyze our weekly trends, right? Because our migration flows variable is for weeks, so we analyze those weekly trends and we compare in between 2015 and 18 the Dominican Re uh, Republic. Immigrants, immigrants to Puerto Rico. And, and that's uh, our first result. Um, you, we have in the bars, the census data, as you can see the immigration um, increase in 2015, then decrease, it, it reduced a lot in 2017, then increase again in 2018. That's the census data, annual data. And in blue uh, is our uh, migration flows variable at weekly levels, and the dots are areas are the average for each year, the annualized data. So we can see that there is a, a correlation there. Of course, we only have four years, so we have to be careful with you know with our conclusions here. But uh, but there is a correlation that it's for these observations is uh, it's above ninety five percent, and. And it only also shows some important things that I will mention in a moment, but that's basically the, the first point. There is a correlation between census data and our immigration flows data. So that's kind of our first strategy to validate. Then we have a second strategy to validate and it's compared with a specific natural events. So we have an event, as we said before, the Hurricane Matthew and subsequent flooding uh, events in the Dominican Republic in 2016. Uh, so we want to check for uh, test for changes in the trend, in the weekly trend after the event. We think that, of course, after the event, Just one more we, should, we should observe an increasing immigrants from Dominican Republic to Puerto Rico. So that means we should increase a, a jam or increasing immigration flows variable. And so let me show you again our immigration flows, immigration flows variable. Again, that's the blue line. The Hurricane Matthew, it's, you can see that in that uh, orange um, right, uh, bar that happened in, two, in October 2016. And then we observe um, 
a jump here, you know, above the, if you can see, you know, it's kind of above the, the, the highest levels in March and April 2017, four months later. Of course, we cannot say, you know, this is the impact of the, of the event, right? But it uh, kind of signal that there is an effect, right? And that of course needs to be explored more. But there is something here that happened four months later, which is consistent to immigrations after those events, again, from Dominican Republic to Puerto Rico. But the other interesting thing is, is in this graph is this big reduction in our immigration flow. And actually, this is after Maria in Puerto Rico. Oh, and I'm, sorry, happened, I'm, sorry, I'm sorry to cut you off, but we're over time. Yeah. If you could wrap up your final thoughts, thank you. Okay, so it seems that, uh, you know, after Maria, there was a reduction in immigration to Puerto Rico, which makes sense and is captured by this variable. So to conclude, um, research question one, yes, we think that it's feasible. We show that it's feasible. Um, is this a valid instrument? We think that we, it's promising. We need a stronger validity approach. There are several implications for public health, um, you know, related to the importance of, of tracking migration in real time. And, and for, our, for future directions, well, we want to extend the validation to all Caribbean countries and expand this tool to the continental US. So, I mean, I have, that, that's it. You can get the presentation in the QR bar. Um, thank you. Thank you so much, Alejandro. And I wanna just, again, thank you to Maria, Eileen, Leonard, and of course, Alejandro on these amazing presentations. I wanna, we just have about three minutes, but if anybody has any questions, they can put those in the chat box and we can ask the authors. And I don't see any, questions yet. So I think I will kick us off with a question for everybody. For the three school-related presentations, um, it is very clear that these cascading and compounding disasters are going to continue to affect the islands and the mainland um, over the coming years and uh, in turn really affect the schools and the students as you've seen um, through your research. And so I was wondering if there was any main thing that stood out from your work that gives you hope for how schools and communities are going to be able to face these challenges that are probably going to continue long into the future um, in a more successful way. So anybody who wants to jump on and answer can start. So maybe Ted could jump in with me here, but yes, I think there's hope because I mean, two ways, I mean, structurally, they're already making repairs and moving, like I said, for some of the condemned schools, they're moving some of those and they've taken some approaches from the school district side. And I think on, I, I think there's hope too, because it appears that there's some elements of counseling ongoing, it's just extending it. And whereas people are, individual has taken initiatives in the past, it seems to imply that, um, as as because um, hurricanes and all of those occur basically every year, um, that they're more willing to engage and the community is more willing to engage. I mean, so we think there's hope for to deal with the mental aspects of students in the longer term. Ted, certainly, and and in addition, um, one of the things the study did was to create for the respondent teachers the kind of awareness that I don't think that, that um, was common among them about the impacts that students face. And so part of their recommendation was a more long-term approach to, to identifying the kids and providing support for the kids. And I think part of it also stemmed from their own experience with the, with the hurricane and being the hurricanes and being able to, to tap into that experience, then they begin to understand what these kids may have gone through and they feel that um, there should be a greater involvement um, from the perspective of the school to be able to provide the kind of support the students need moving forward, particularly the long-term support. Um, but, but the challenge for us though is to, is to have um, a tool, and, and we discussed that, um, we probably need a tool that would help the kids to since often they are reluctant, it seems, to be able to, to, 
to self, to self as a tool. I'm not sure an app or something that allows them first to be able to to enter the data, speak to how they feel, and that can feed into um, some database that the that the counselors and teachers can use to be able to now go in and help the students. But we have to find some way to get the kids to to self report, and then. Um, get the response from counselors and um, teachers. Thank you, Ted. Eileen, were you going to add to that? Um, I think in our experience, we find that the, the way the school react to disaster is very diverse. And we see some schools that are really proactive and they accomplish a lot. Mm -hmm. And I think the challenge is how do you institu institutionalize that type of response? What we're seeing is a lot of inequity. We have some school, and usually are schools that have really strong leadership or schools that have really strong community ties. So those schools are able to unite people to reach the, for the community and really help the students and are able to maintain certain level of academic achievement, of enrollment, and even provide emotional support for the student. But then we see other schools that are really reactive and that are waiting for the central level to tell them what they need to do or what they can do. And there's where we find the problem. So I, I think that the real challenge is how we get, how we teach all schools to be proactive and be ready to act in an emergency setting. Mm -hmm. Oh, Maria, uh, did you want to unmute? I see your. No, I um, only agree with the, with the colleagues of what they are saying about uh, our challenge. Uh, we need to uh, trust more in in the community, in the whole community, as uh, bonding uh, and, and and capable of bonding and, and promoting this capital, social capital. Uh, empathy uh, to practices to practice more this um, in our settings uh, every day uh, every time not only in disasters moments or uh, every day uh, so we can get more mature uh, on doing this as a practice when these disasters comes but I agree with the colleagues yeah. Yeah, yeah. I was particularly interested in in yours, Maria, with empathy and how do we institutionalize that? How do we, um, you know, not only rely on that as we all clearly need resources and more, you know, um, other kinds of things for schools, but to to somehow keep empathy as a central focus for um, how to prepare for schools in the future. Yeah, it's, it, it was a, a conversation I we have in that team. How come? Uh, uh, empathy is, uh, is, is it can you teach or learn and practice and institutionalize empathy? Yes, we can. I think we can. It's a skill. Uh, we don't uh, learn with empathy. We develop in community, in socialization, in our relationships, in school, and these citizens' competencies we work with uh, the whole year are very important uh, to teach them uh, since we are kids when kids are in the school, and then develop them as well. We hold the lifestyle, all and also in the university, and we we hope we can transform our relationships, our, our, our and confront better or these disasters that that are creatures of our. Uh, social, societal relationships and economics and political decisions. Um, these, all these disasters are natural, but they have a, a lot of collateral that came from social, economic, and political decisions that make us more vulnerable. As Bourdieu, as we said about Bourdieu and all the, the theories we, we check, check up in, the, in all this uh, investigation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Um, okay, still I'm not seeing any questions. So I will move to my question for Alejandro. I, um, 
you know, I'm really fascinated by capturing this migration flow and the, the data that you're collecting is just, um, I'm sure, so time consuming to, <laughs> to evaluate and analyze. Um, but I was wondering, I know we had to cut you off a little early, if you can talk a little bit more about the public health impacts of the migra migration flows and what those next steps are going to be for your research. Right. I think, I mean, the first, really the first step is to validate the tool, right? To be sure that it really works. So far, I think we have a, a good signal that it works, but we need to, to validate. And, and once it's validated, our plan is to connect with um, NGOs from Puerto Rico, for example, to, to share this in a website and to provide even online training, for example, on how to use the tool so they can, you know, track um, immigrants from different areas. I think that, that um, you know, we, we discuss, of course, this will be available uh, and we can make it available to, to the Department of Health in Puerto Rico, but probably the NGOs are the ones that can have, you know, a, 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 a different use um, um, in terms of protecting immigrants um, and identifying, you know, immigrants in, in, when they transit to Puerto Rico, right? So. That's that's kind of the of the goal that we have. Of course, we need to partner. Um, I have met today. I mean, through these presentations to uh, to the University of Puerto Rico, for example, that that would be great partners to to check and and make this possible, right? Great, thank you. And we do still have four minutes. I'm sorry, I said only three minutes left here earlier, but it was actually 13 minutes left. So now we have four minutes left. If anybody would just want to even jump on and unmute yourself and ask a question, that is perfectly fine. Um, I invite you to do so now if you have any questions for any of the presenters. Um, this is Ted. I wanted to ask uh, Maria a question. Um, I, I realize that um, part of your study moved away from, from the individual approach to, to resilience and focused a lot more on the, the social aspect, social um, capital aspect. But have you considered um, mindset, individual mindset, as a factor in the kind of resilience that you're seeing among Puerto Rican students? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, uh, we we raise uh, we all raise in school now uh, in, in the individual uh, uh, practices. Uh, we learned that from school and many settings, but uh, human beings uh, doesn't uh, uh, raise as, uh, as, as human beings uh, in, in individual forms, but in societies, in communities. Uh, and they, they teach us individual settings and, and, and mindsets, but the reality is that we are, are all in by fact uh, interdependent and societal groups and when things uh, come to us in when we have problems and all of that uh, these individuals uh, mindsets uh, get broke because we can survive uh, with this with this individual mindset so we then we start as a natural process and I'm community psychologist I'm talking from my own mind frame, <laughs> and my mind frame is uh, is that uh, we need uh, since we get born to survive to to live in interdependent and and community uh, relations and settings. Although we think we are doing things uh, uh, individually, I don't know if I'm uh, uh, getting uh, having a uh, uh, an answer to what you are asking, but uh, what I said is that uh, it's an ideology to think uh, about this individualistic mindset. Uh, and the what we discover uh, and what, what this research give us as a response was that these uh, jobs, the students, uh, university students, told us in very different ways in all the, the, the techniques we use to, to check with them uh, was that they told us that uh, they survive and they remain and they stay and I bet they succeeded in the university uh, 
getting uh, together, having uh, these relationships uh, that came naturally uh, from policemen, from teachers, from professors, from families, for neighbors. And they doesn't come from institutionalized uh, settings like the university administration or the municipality or the government or inclusive by uh, uh, community organizations. Uh, they came from these uh, social relationships that came from the adverse the adversity that uh, uh, put make these uh, uh, relationships between them. So I'm very uh, optimistic uh, with this uh, result that this uh, that we can uh, start uh, in dialogue and to dialogue more about uh, what what means uh, individualistic uh, whatever. What that means really uh, from facts uh, up more than ideology or as a paradigm for some someone who wants us to get us like big Junchu Han says uh, to get us all apart individualistic and think that we are all alone by our own. I think uh, we need to, to talk more about uh, this ideology and, and try to see more the reality we are facing and the reality we are facing is that Hey everyone, I know we all just got kicked out of our breakout rooms, but thank you once again for joining today. That was a wonderful compilation of presentations and we love hearing about your research. Please do check back to our website and view those final reports to learn more. Thank you, everyone. That it's developed by the, by the USGS. Um, so, uh, so that's pretty much the four pieces that we're doing. Uh, the truth communities in which we're working are La Luna in Juanica, Indios in Guayanilla, and La Perla in San Juan. Juanica is particularly uh, 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 interesting because uh, it, it is uh, Puerto Rico's, uh, it, pretty much it was known as Puerto Rico's capital when the Spanish uh, came in. It was also the site to which uh, the United States uh, invaded Puerto Rico in 1898. Uh, at some point, it became one of the largest uh, sugar mills in the in the Caribbean uh, and in the world. Uh, and its economy has has been transformed, has gone through many phases of transformation from agricultural to industrial uh, to now more the industrialized economy with a very uh, small service sector uh, that it's pretty much fast food. So uh, it's an area with a lot with very high poverty levels. Uh, over 60% of the residents live below poverty, uh, and in 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 this this uh, trends are amplified when you look at, for example, children. Uh, that's one of the things that we've been doing, talking to school directors and understanding a bit uh, about the situation with the schools because there's only one school working there. Um, and directors report that over 90% of the children's of the children registered uh, at the school come from a household uh, living below poverty. Uh, so, so it also talks about the financial insecurity of those younger uh, generations. Uh, Indios in Guayanilla, uh, it's also uh, uh, another municipality that uh, has a very uh, long historical trajectory, also tied uh, to the agricultural sector. Uh, there's, they still are uh, very, uh, imp do a lot of, uh, practice a lot of agriculture, particularly uh, for exports to Europe. Uh, they do a lot of uh, uh, fruits like papaya, mangoes. Um, over 50% of the population also lives below poverty. Um, they also house the Costa Sur Energy Complex, which produces over a quarter of the electricity for the island. Uh, so there are also issues of, for example, uh, air quality uh, in, in Wajanija associated to the, um, the, en the energy generation. Um, and the last community in which we're working is La Perla. It's located in the outskirts of Old San Juan, outside of the of the walled uh, sector of the city wall, uh, and it's notorious for its for its nightlife, 
uh, in, in its uh, informal economy. Uh, in the last few years, it has received a lot of attention and that has also changed uh, the, the, the kind of activities that happen uh, in the communities. Uh, residents have encountered a lot of challenges in terms of dealing with the influence of tourists uh, and particularly because the community is perceived as a place where people can come and have fun uh, they 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 had a, a lot of of issues uh, during the beginning of the pandemic with with crowding uh, over 600 people uh, in in streets that are pretty much small hallways uh, with Without using any protective equipment, uh, so it was very uh, uh, challenging for residents to deal with the situation and to also take protective actions for themselves and for their relatives. Um, so here you can see uh, uh, pretty much the distribution of the seismic activity related to the 2020 uh, seismic sequence. Uh, the communities, the location of the communities with which we're working, La Luna and Indios, which are very much close to the epicenter of the uh, January 7th earthquake, and La Perla, which is very distant uh, in sense from uh, the other two communities, but who also has an amplified uh, risk perception when it comes to earthquake because of how uh, the, the, con the construction of how their, how their houses, how their homes uh, were built, which are pretty much self-built homes. Um, so in terms of that cumulative exposure, we asked them if they had uh, damages related to Hurricane Maria and also if they had damages related to Hurricane earthquakes. And 35% uh, uh, had damage from Hurricane Maria and 63% uh, had some damage from uh, the earthquakes. Uh, this is particularly tied to the trajectory of the hurricane. Uh, communities in southwest Puerto Rico uh, did not receive as an impact as strong as others at the northern and northeast uh, side of the island. Uh, so so it, the, the pattern um, makes sense, but still you can see uh, that 35 percent of them had uh, damage from Maria and that 63 had damage uh, also from the earthquakes. Uh, this is another question that we had in which we asked them uh, about other events to which they had been exposed in the last five years uh, to look at uh, the, their exposure. Um, in terms of COVID, uh, we asked them about if, if they were following the number of cases and that was one of the, the big takeaways uh, from this part of the research, uh, particularly in COVID, uh, residents who answer the survey and also participants of in-depth interviews tend to look for information on how to protect themselves uh, and on understanding the virus and not so much information on the number of cases. Uh, they 62% uh, reported that they never look for information of the number of cases in their municipality and uh, 76 said that they don't know how many cases are uh, uh, import, uh, have been reported in Puerto Rico, 86% uh, for their municipality. That difference is very much from people that said yes because they see it uh, particularly on TV. Um, but in terms of information seeking about COVID, uh, what they look for is information on how to protect themselves and how pretty much they can uh, um, 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 get infected with the, with the virus and how the virus behaves. They're trying to pretty much understand how uh, the science about the virus has developed. Um, municipalities have active tracing programs deployed by the Puerto Rico Department of Health. Uh, however, uh, information sharing between the state and municipalities is limited. So in terms of the organizing the response and allocating resources, uh, sometimes it's challenging because the, the, the level of detail in terms of, of, of identifiers of the areas that need to be uh, disinfected or that require attention from the municipality is not as exact. They will tell them, oh, uh, 
there's a, there's there's an increase in cases in ex barrio, uh, but the geographic extension of that area it's pretty big, and and they don't really know uh, they don't they don't don't know much about what is required from them. Uh, there is a concern regarding sheltering. Some school shelters do not have showers, working cisterns. Uh, or appropriate facilities for persons with special needs. Uh, this was something that was reported after Maria uh, and changes are still have, have not happened. Uh, there's also an issue that is very much tied to that broader uh, uh, context that we talk about the economic crisis. Uh, uh, government agencies at the state level have reduced the number of employees that they have. Uh, so they don't have as, as many employees to, for example, uh, assign to the different shelters in the 78 municipalities. Uh, they, they require at least two employees for each shelters, but they don't necessarily have enough employees to send out uh, to the municipalities. Um, COVID-19 have also altered uh, social relations in communities in the sense of how they deal with the earthquake. Uh, they used to evacuate their homes and go to the park in the community. They do that, but so, uh, but they can do it as a group. Uh, so the coping mechanism and the social ties that sort of allow them to deal with the uncertainty uh, related to the uh, on, ongoing activity uh, is, is disrupted. Um, Residents of Ropela have seen an increase in the number of people visiting the community during the pandemic. Uh, moreover, visitors tend to ignore personal protection, protection recommendations and guidelines. Uh, they try to uh, have their own campaigns to seek uh, support from the Department of Health, uh, but the volume of people that come to the community and the number of employee of, for example, employees from the Department of Health assign, uh, it, it's, it's not, uh, enough. Uh, so and as I said, uh, I mentioned this, uh, participants tend to look up the in-depth interviews, tend to look for information on protective measures and, and not so much for information on the number of cases. Um, something else in, in terms of the, of the different graphs, uh, when it came to information sources and their perception of how knowledgeable were different actors, uh, the 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 highly the high the, the one that was hot that had the the highest uh uh sort of rate when it came to how much people think that uh what measure do you think that the medical task force was knowledgeable about covid uh it was actually the medical task force uh because it provided that information not necessarily on the number of cases but on how the virus worked and what they could do and what was expected. Uh, people talked about how uh, seeing the different epidemiological models that were developed allowed them to have a better sense of what could happen. Um, Dr. Santos, just to let you know, you have um, one minute to go. Okay. okay. Um, so I'm just gonna highlight uh, a few other things uh, about the earthquakes to uh, just uh, finish up. Uh, in terms of the earthquake, most of the folks were in their house. Uh, they were, uh, uh, they stayed where they were or they went outside of their structure. Um, they looked for information, uh, particularly uh, from others or from social media because there was no electricity uh, and that's something that comes up event after an event and that it's a discussion when we talk about creating apps uh, for response. Uh, oftentimes there's no uh, energy to uh, receive information through any of those uh, apps. Um, when they evacuated, most people went with a relative or with a friend. They did not went to a public shelter and that it's in contrast with uh, the perception of some officials that have participated in the in-depth uh, interviews who perceive that people go to shelters because they want to get help from the government uh, um, as if it's, you know, the preferred choice. Um, in terms of how long they were uh, outside of their homes, anywhere from two weeks to three months. Um, and this is pretty much uh, other of the, of the findings and some of the patterns that we've 
had uh, so far in terms of uh, if they know uh, if there's the probability of a higher event, if they've made any adjustments, um, what they've done, uh, if their house has been inspected. Uh, and then this is some of the other work that we're doing uh, with the uh, visualizations. Um, and then the last thing that we're going to be uh, doing is the focus groups, and these are the questions uh, that uh, Dr. Nania Campbell, who is going to be working on the uh, evaluation, is going to be following up. Um, so uh, I don't want to take any more time or to extend myself beyond my one minute. So, uh, yep. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Santos. Um, we will have time at the end for questions. So if everyone could just, um, if if Dr. Santos's team wants to add a little bit more too, because I know you didn't get to go through a lot of stuff, we'll have um, about 20 minutes at the end to go through awesome. um, some to go through some other information. And then, um, if you have questions, if you can either note them in the chat box or you can note them on a piece of paper, and we'll try to get to all of those um, at the end of the session. So the next group up is um, sharing during disasters, learning from island res residents, and Dr. Carl Kim is going to be presenting. Um, can you share, go ahead and share your screen? Okay, great. Thank you. Okay. Are you ready, Dr. Kim? Okay. Can you hear me? Okay. Great. It's uh, great to see you all. Uh, I wish we were meeting in person. Um, and I hope you all are uh, staying safe. Uh, I want to begin by uh, acknowledging my co-authors, uh, Junath Gamiri, who's on this call, uh, and Eric uh, Yamashita, uh, both from the University of Hawaii. Uh, I direct a, a FEMA Homeland Security Center, the National Disaster Preparedness Training Center, which is a congressionally authorized center that develops uh, FEMA certified training courses for emergency managers, first responders, uh, and then actually uh, other members of the community that are involved in all phases of uh, disaster response uh, and uh, recovery. Uh, by way of background, I'm an urban planning professor. Uh, so the way that I kind of approach, the way that our team approaches things uh, really focuses on uh, planning and knowledge to action and some of the other types of activities uh, that uh, are, are very much related to the research that uh, I hope to present today. Some of you may have seen this. We did a version of this uh, earlier before. We have some updates uh, uh, for that as well too. Um, Junath, if you can also post uh, links uh, in the chat for the NDPTC and our contact information, uh, that, will, that, that will be helpful. Um, so again, uh, what we wanted to focus on was the sharing behaviors uh, during uh, disasters. There's been a lot of interest in sharing economies, the sharing uh, as a phenomenon. And we thought we would focus specifically on what happens um, during disasters. And we define sharing as the voluntary exchange of goods and services uh, among people who are not uh, family uh, nor friends. And then we uh, administered uh, a questionnaire uh, in Puerto Rico, US Virgin Islands, Guam, uh, Commonwealth of Northern Mariana Islands, American Samoa, and then also in Hawaii uh, as, as kind of a reference case as well too. And in that questionnaire, we asked what was, what was shared during disasters? What were the mechanisms for sharing? What are some of the barriers uh, to sharing? Um, and again, we're very much interested in what are some of the strategies or the actions that can increase sharing and other pro-social uh, behaviors? Uh, and then, uh, and then, based on this survey, uh, we uh, did some statistical analyses, some kind of standard statistical tests, 
uh, we developed a, a kind of an indicator variable that we're most interested in that, uh, that we call the propensity to share, and then used a variety of different models uh, to test what are the characteristics um, across these uh, different uh, communities that explain uh, sharing, sharing behaviors. Um, then in addition to that, we had some um, uh, qualitative data. We uh, had some interviews. We had some qualitative responses on the surveys. We held some uh, focus group meetings. Um, and so I want to kind of summarize some of the takeaways that we have from this and also where we think this research is headed. Um, okay, so I mentioned that uh, propensity to share variable. And what we were trying to look at is both the number of items that were shared and then the frequency of sharing. And then we kind of derived for every respondent this propensity to uh, share uh, variable. Uh, and so it, it could range from zero to nine. The mean was 5.6. Uh, and then and then we look for the characteristics of those that have the highest propensity to share. And interestingly, uh, uh, among the total group, uh, those below age 30 reported the most sharing, the most good shared, also females, Pacific Islanders uh, also uh, as, as, uh, as well too. And then in terms of the goods and services shared included things like uh, food, and water and uh, shelter and housing. But the most important was water, food, uh, and shelter. Um, and the least important uh, vehicles and clothing. Um, the most difficult sharing involved uh, 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 shelter and housing, also money, uh, water, uh, and, uh, and other services. The other thing that we were really interested in uh, examining was the different types of disasters and hazards. So we compiled a long list of different hazards and threats and looked at them. And one of the things that we found was that the most sharing occurred typically during hurricanes, except for Maria, and then the least during um, COVID-19. And that makes a certain amount of sense because people were discouraged from sharing uh, uh, spaces for, uh, for a variety of reasons. Um, we uh, ran some uh, uh, regression models um, and, you know, the R square squares weren't that really strong. I mean, it was uh, an R squared of 12, uh, 12%. Um, and we have some interpretations of this. We, we, but actually the coefficients kind of made sense in terms of the size of them, the order of them. Um, uh, for the, we also did a focus model uh, looking at uh, the sharing of homes and, and shelter. And there were some really interesting results with, uh, with American Samoa uh, coming up with a, with a very high odds ratio on the propensity to, to share compared to um, all other groups. And, and, and we'll talk about some of the things that we found uh, based on the uh, focus groups and, and other work that we've been doing. Um, part of what we were trying to do was to evaluate different types of strategies and then how the respondents uh, categorize them as the best strategies in blue, the good strategies in kind of orange, and then the neither good nor bad strategies in gray, and then the bad strategies, and then the, the, the worst strategies. And what we were interested in looking at were things like, well, creating, uh, using technology, like an electronic a bulletin board, uh, using or modifying existing platforms, um, the role of government, strong government, uh, and then uh, the potential role of NGOs. And if you kind of look at this, the really strong blue variables show in terms of the involvement of government uh, and, the, and then also uh, NGOs and faith-based organizations. Uh, and, and so that's, that's one of the takeaways that, that we took from, uh, from this analysis in terms of 
looking at who should be responsible, the types of actions uh, that should be taken, uh, and, and, and so forth. We also generated, uh, you know, through this uh, analysis, um, some word clouds using the NVivo content analysis software. And what we were trying to do was to compile for all the respondents the, the 200, 500 most significant words. And we kind of analyzed those as well, too. And, you know, it was really interesting. The, the, the first word cloud uh, shows the entire uh, sample. Um, and, you know, you see really the importance of community, uh, the importance of culture, uh, the importance of, of people. Uh, it, it, these, are, these are the things that come out. And then we wanted to try to compare the, uh, the responses across the different islands. And if you see, for example, the American Samoa word cloud, this notion of Samoa family really comes out very, very, uh, very strongly in addition to the community and, and culture. We did similar clouds for uh, Puerto Rico, uh, U.S. Virgin Islands, and there is this kind of commonality uh, across all islands with this strong emphasis on culture, on community, uh, on kinship relationships, uh, uh, and, and I think that that's, that, that, that's, that's really important. Um, obviously, because of the thrust of this research, we were trying to focus on the public health uh, implications. And obviously, uh, context is critical, that culture, that local knowledge, indigenous knowledge, th these, are, these are really important uh, factors in terms of understanding these uh, sorts of behaviors. Um, getting at the barriers, um, poor communications emerged, um, health and safety concerns associated with uh, sharing behaviors also uh, arise. It's tied to the concern over legal liabilities, um, particularly for those who are engaged in commercial activities and uh, and, and also, I guess, you know, the, the fear of, of being sued or being held liable, you know, for uh, sharing some sort of good or, or service. We also did see 11% that reported an unwillingness to share. Uh, and 6% reported ethnic or religious uh, differences. We think there may be some underreporting uh, of this, given the kind of sensitive natures uh, of this. Um, one of the other big takeaways is there was strong support for training and education. And one of the things that I wanted to turn to is if we were to invest or to try to develop a course on sharing, sharing during disasters, what would that look like in terms of the content and how would that deliver and, and so forth? I think another big thing was that came out was uh, the importance of improving social relations. 45% um, of this group, which is very pro-socially oriented, uh, said that there was a need to improve social relations. Um, and we think that there are also significant differences between communities, but also within communities and disaster types. Obviously, some of our research has been focusing on social capital and the differences between bonding, bridging, and linking uh, networks, uh, and, and we need to, to think about that. Um, a big part of what we see as sort of the future is to integrate more public health and urban planning and uh, the pandemic lessons. Uh, and so that's part of the, the sort of the big takeaways, although that there are really big critical concerns that we have, others have, with regard to the management of data and information. You know, one of the things to share is information. And there's all these concerns that we have not resolved in terms of access, privacy, proprietary information, you know, and then also, you know, corporate versus public interests uh, with these uh, sharing platforms. And we think that that's a very important uh, area of, of future research to, to work on. Um, we had really great reviewer comments. Uh, you know, uh, that, that we received. I, I think maybe some of you may have um, given us uh, comments uh, on this and um, in, in terms of helping us to refine some of the 
definitions and these kinds of notions and terms that we're using uh, because there are sometimes almost well-defined terms with regard to quarantine, social distancing, or isolation, but uh, but a, a better need to <clears throat> define many of these emerging terms. Um, again, with this, there are some biases with an electronic survey done during a pandemic. <clears throat> we know that uh, looking at the respondents, educated people that are connected, older people that are concerned about risk management, we used our networks, which again may have biased this more towards uh, uh, emergency managers and, and, and others. It was really difficult to calculate a response rate of the 285 valid in this initial batch. You know, we think we sent it out <coughs> to about 10,000 email messages, uh, 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 links that we had, and we got that about a 3% response rate. It was uh, higher in other communities, uh, such as in America and Samoa and Puerto Rico, uh, lower in others. Uh, I think we need to focus more on uh, COVID and the sharing behaviors. Why Hawaii? Uh, you know, it was included as well in this because I think that Hawaii does kind of provide a crosswalk between some of the territories and the other. Uh, state entities uh, as well, too. Um, Sorry to interrupt, Dr. Kim, you have one more minute to go. Okay, I have <laughs> about one more slide, right? And, and then uh, we have, uh, you know, some uh, key findings from our focus groups, which I've hit. One of them is the real importance of, uh, of schools uh, and community uh, organizations. Uh, the other, from an urban planning perspective, is the role of land use, zoning, building codes, uh, and then and then also part of the challenge, I think, is looking at the difference between voluntary uh, and structured sharing versus more emergent uh, uh, sharing. And again, I think that we do have some limitations. We're trying to blend the qualitative and qualitative analysis. We think there's a dark side to this social capital. And I think there's more research uh, that needs to, to be done. And so I'd like to kind of, uh, wrap this up by uh, encouraging you to, you know, I know this is a first pass at our, at our results and we look forward to hearing from you as to uh, this topic and whether you'd be interested in joining us on trying to uh, develop uh, a uh, sharing uh, course. Thank you, Dr. Kim, that was really fascinating. Um, well, definitely if you have questions, please be, remember to um, write them in the chat box or go ahead and note them down and we'll come back around um, um, for the last 15 minutes and we'll do questions for, for everybody who has presented. Um, now we have um, Dr. Monique Constance Huggins is going to present photo voice and cultural comp competence in disaster recovery in St. Croix. Good uh, morning or afternoon, wherever you are. Good day. I hope all is well. Um, it's certainly a pleasure for me to present on this topic for the voice and cultural competence in disaster recovery in St. Croix. I am Monique Constance Huggins. My um, co-author, Alexis Sharp, is not here with us, but she certainly sent greetings. So please do accept her greetings today. So really quickly, um, I'm mindful of time. I'm just going to share a little bit on the background methodology findings and implications. And if you were in that initial meeting a month or so ago, you would have heard some of this. And so um, just pretend you have not heard anything and listen to the presentation with fresh eyes. Um, by way of background, we all know that we are facing with we are being faced with increasing disasters um, every time you turn around there's a new disaster there's a new hurricane or, or a tornado of some sort or volcanic eruption like in, in my island St. Vincent and the Grandines uh, back in April our active volcano decided to act up but at any rate we are hearing of increasing disasters um, not only are they increase in terms of numbers, but se severity. And we know that these are having tremendous impact on people's lives. Um, and so I, I would suggest that these two things really call on us to pay close attention to disaster recovery. Now, what we do know is that there's so many factors that are helpful with regards to disaster recovery. Cultural competence, 
we know is crucial for effective service delivery, including disaster work. However, one of the things that is quite frustrating for me as a researcher, for me as a social worker, is that when we do look at the literature around disaster recovery and cultural competence, it's certainly lacking. Um, as a social worker, when I listen to social workers talking about um, factors that are effective, that help to advance service delivery, very, uh, I, I cannot hear enough of cultural competence. I don't often hear it, which is unfortunate because it's so important, yet it seems to be absent in our conversation, particularly with regards to disaster work. And so this has really provided the impetus for me to focus on cultural competency in disaster work. So um, my work, or our work was guided by two research questions. One, what are people's perceptions of the impact of cultural competence on disaster recovery efforts? And then two, what are there similarities or are there differences in these perceptions between community members, right, and disaster workers? Reality is that community members might have one view of cultural competence. Meanwhile, when you talk to disaster workers, they have a very different view. Like, oh no, we're good. We we're we we are awesome. We we are on point with cultural competence, but the, the the community folks may have a very different view. And so the study seek or sought to find this out. Um, like was mentioned in the in the in, at the beginning, this was conducted on the island of St. Croix. We use a very unique methodology that is called photo voice, very powerful, very unique um, methodology. It is qualitative in nature. It's really a community-based participatory approach developed by Wang over a couple, a couple years ago. And what this does, it uses photo, photographs to help us establish themes about social concepts, which would include um, cultural competence. The food voice process is, is extremely involved. It requires, and this is why it's participatory, it requires members of the community, it requires participants to become so involved in this project. So unlike other types of approach, a quantitative approach where folks simply, for and, 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 and I'm not dismissing it, I'm simply saying that in a quantitative approach, folks may simply um, complete a survey. In photo voice, we're asking people to spend a lot of time to think about what, first of all, take photos. We, we ask them to use their cell phone, you know, or we, we are not able to provide them with cameras. We ask them to use their cell phone. We ask them to think about the photos that they wanna take. Think about cultural competence and capture seeds, capture images that in their mind reflect cultural competence. That requires a whole lot of convincing people that this is a methodology, number one, convincing people to use their phone, number two, convincing people to take the time to drive up and down the island during COVID when some folks said, well, I'm working from home, I'm really not passing this location. And I said, well, maybe a drive out might help you to take your mind off of COVID. So it really required a whole lot of um, involvement on the part of the participants. So they sent photos and they had to attach narratives about these photos. In other words, tell us what these photos represent with regards to cultural competence. Tell us what the photo is and what it represents. And um, they also had to attend a focus group session at the end. So this is where community members all came together and shared their photos. So it was really a powerful, powerful um, event. Like I said, it took a lot of convincing. It took a lot of teaching people what is photo voice, how to use the cat. Well, they already know how to take great pictures, but how to be respectful, you know, just don't show up and, and take a photo of somebody in the face and say, oh, I need this for a project. No, it, it required a whole lot of training with regards to what is ethical and what's unethical. Um, we had 20 participants, 20 um, individuals, um, sorry, community residents and 10 disaster workers. They were mostly female, um, um, on the younger side and predominantly black. What we used was a methodology called snowball and also convenience, I would say. Snowball in the sense that we reached out to two organizations. Um, we were not able to travel again because of you know, COVID, we were constrained in that regard. And so we reached out to two organizations and build relationships. One of the things I'll talk about a little later on, time permitting, is the importance of building relationships when conducting studies 
with communities that you're not a part of. I might be familiar with St. Croix, given that I'm also from the Caribbean, but I'm not Crucian, right? Um, had no contacts there. So having to build relationships and actually to become involved in such a an involved type of methodology really took some work. And so once you were able to build relationships with those two organizations, we asked them to refer us to other people, to convince other people on the island that this was legit, this was a great pro a project and it's worth the involvement. So that was our approach to um, the project or the methods. With regards to our findings, we had, seven themes emerging from the photos, the narratives, and the focus group combined. One of the first themes that came about with regards to how people saw disaster recovery was that of neglect. Folks describe cultural competence as the lack of neglect with regards to the repairs. Um, so for example, somebody said, these pictures show the government lack of attention towards issues and problems the people of the community face that need to be addressed and never are. Um, there was a lot of conversation about three years later, we are still, we have not seen much progress. Three years later, buildings that were important, that are important to the community have not been repaired. And so this lack of neglect. Somebody also said, so much has been overlooked in the recovery efforts from a storm that occurred over three years ago for a poor community in dire need of recreational outlets. Um, folks talk a lot about things such as playgrounds being neglected, places for children to play escape for them. And these are things that have been neglected and that this neglect in their mind represents that lack of respect and, and lack of cultural competence. Another theme that emerge was that of cultural blindness. Folks described um, cultural blindness as, again, disregard for a lot of the cultural norms on the island by many of the disaster workers. Um, one person wrote, this is cultural incompetence because it is a failure to recognize the cultural norms of the island and to build in options for these individuals. This person was speaking specifically of um, disaster workers asking residents of St. Croix for a deed in order to get help with their building. So somebody talked about even getting a few dollars to repair a window, I needed to show a deed. Multiple, multiple residents spoke of one of the cultural norms of parents or grandparents or great grandparents passing down homes. It said there are people living in homes that they don't have a title, they don't have a deed to it, but it's theirs, that grandparents, and that this is really throughout, throughout the island. And, and this is powerful because I would say more than half of the persons we spoke to presented this as an issue, as one of those norms on the island where people just don't have deed. They live in the house for years. They know it was, it was their grandmoms and their moms and passed down to them, but there's not a deed. And that disaster workers are now asking them to show a deed, just for a few dollars in many cases, um, some people reported. One participant I thought was amusing, one participant said a lot of this work is just, it's burdensome and it's red tape. And she illustrated this red tape by showing us a, a FEMA application and literally drawing a red tape to it. Uh, basically saying, yes, we know that there's a requirement on FEMA's part for a deed, but there's this something called cultural norms. Is there a way to reconcile? Is there a way to be creative and to come up with, to help people rather than be, um, being a stickler for, yes, we need a deed. And if there's no deed, you can't even get a few dollars to repair a window. And so this was, people express this thought in a very passionate, passionate way. Um, another theme that came, was presented was, unawareness of structural barriers. Many participants share that in their mind, lack of competence, cultural competence was reflected in folks on awareness of the structural barriers. In other words, if help is being offered, one must, if we're doing disaster recovery, one must consider are there barriers to individuals getting help, specifically being able to show up to places, let's say, to collect water, being able to attend, a, um, show up at a, a particular venue. Um, one person wrote, and I'm showing, I believe I could, yes, you're seeing this. One person wrote, 
These young army guys were standing guard at the front door, checking your ID to hand you a case of water. Um, she went on to say, what does it take to walk door to door? The island is only 40 miles long. Um, another participant um, chimed in and said, right down the street, there were people with disabilities. There were seniors living within a block or two without any transportation and communication who need help. And so this, as, as Persa spoke during the focus group, it came across really strongly that very often there was a lack of awareness that workers had for what are the realities of people. Do we have seniors who can't leave their homes? Do we have people with disabilities who can't walk? Yes, we're here providing X, Y, Z, and we expect people to come, but is there an understanding that many people who need help just cannot come because they don't have transportation or just or they just can't move? And so this lack of um, awareness of structural barriers was presented as really a lack of cultural competence when um, doing disaster recovery work. Other themes, um, a negative theme came about was that of contributions to social problems. You may ask, what is this? Well, um, a couple uh, of the, of the um, residents talked about the influx of workers as a result of, you know, individuals coming in to assist. And what they have noticed is that there has been a, an increase in the number of bars in particular, and several, like I said, a couple of them talked about the number of bars that have popped up on the island since these, since the disaster work, since the disasters, and that they think that this is in as a result of you know individuals not considering the uniqueness of the island, not considering the social um, landscape of the island, and that. In these bars, and I'm very careful with my words, but in these bars, um, a lot of questionable activities, to use their words, a lot of questionable activities have been going on. Folks, I don't have a photo here, but folks also talk about the number of um, individuals that are now homeless. Why are they homeless? Because what has happened is that there's been an increase in the, the in housing rate, rate the, sorry, increase in rental. Um, why? Because many of the workers who have come in have been able to pay a lot more for rental property than local individuals can pay. And as a result, that has driven up the cost of um, rental across the island. Several persons spoke about that, that residents cannot even find places to live and that people are now homeless. They said you may not see them on the street, but they're couch surfing. They're going from family, family couch to a friend's couch because they simply can't afford it because of this influx of workers who have driven up the cost of rent. And so when you think about that, this is an increase in social problems. One of those unintended consequences. Um, folks also express a lack of cultural competence through the bias treatment um, that they saw going on. And this is with regards to a geographic area, but also with regards to population. So for example, um, and this came out really vividly during the focus group session where persons spoke passionately or, or you know in a very heartfelt way about the, the difference in treatment in Frederickstown versus Christensen. Now these are two um, tongues on St. Croix, um, folks said that Frederickstead has received less attention than Christensen. Um, Folks spoke specifically um, of trash pileup, of debris pileup that had been sitting for weeks and for months on the street of Kristen said that meanwhile, sorry, Frederick said, meanwhile, Kristen said received a lot more attention. Um, in addition to that, folks also talk, and, and I don't have the quote here, but one person said, is it because Frederick said um, is more heavily populated with um, persons of color compared to Christian said, and not just persons of color, but also people of um, higher social, uh, sorry, Frederick said is populated with people of lower so socioeconomic status. Um, somebody also talked about disregard for the elderly population and that precedent has been given to other things. For example, the neglect of the Wim Garden, and it's a community for seniors who are on a fixed income. 
They said, yet funds are being raised to place red colored lights across the street in order to help turtles get back to the sand. Um, they, I, I, and I, I remember the way this person was talking about how are we neglecting in a very, again, passionate way, how are we neglecting our senior citizen? Well, how are we neglecting these individuals who are on a fixed income, who can't afford, yet we're spending money for red lights because we're so concerned about us. And this is, and again, in her mind, she's saying, shouldn't we be valuing um, the folks here more than turtles was her expression. So again, bias treatment came about as a theme for lack of cultural competence. Um, and I would say that these negative themes were expressed more heavily by community residents while we see that the, the, the disaster workers express more positive themes. And this is a good transition into what were some of those positive themes? One, we have leveraging community support. Um, we had disaster workers talking about how they were able to rally the community around them. And they showed photos of how through volunteer help, they recognized, as somebody talked earlier about the village, right? Somebody, um, they recognized that the disaster recovery process required folks to become involved, helping out each other. And so they recognized that cultural competence included forming relationships with the people in the community to help each other. Um, they also talk about having that final nail service, which I thought was beautiful. Uh, and this is a symbolic service where the, the homeowner actually gets to drive the last nail in whether it's the window or the door, as you know, symbolizing that this is the end of the repair. And the worker said, we have community. We love when community help each other. We love when individuals help each other. Um, <laughs> not sure where I am for time. Um, I, you have one, one more minute. <laughs> who knows what happened to the type? All right, <laughs> addressing language barriers that again came out as a positive theme um, expressed by disaster workers. One disaster, another disaster worker said that she was hired um, specifically because of her ability to speak Spanish. A um, couple others said that they were just pleased that um, this one organization, long term. Um, recovery group provided flyers, provided information in different language because they recognize that many people across the, the, the you know, there's there's differences with regards to um, what is spoken. And so to, in order to reach people, they have to provide information in different languages. One of the things we ask is for people to give us recommendations. Don't have time to go through all, but something I wanted to point out, folks talk about identifying cultural ambassadors in different fields to work alongside and help non-crucial workers, such as non-islands from the United States. And I thought that this was powerful. And to me, it really talks about partnership that um, even if somebody um, is helping who might not be culturally competent, recognizing that there's an ambassador that they can talk to as assume, as opposed to going into the community and, you know, practicing or doing work without having an awareness. The point is to establish relationships and talk to folks on the ground so that the work can be more impactful and more effective. We do know that this has health and um, public health implications. If folks are not practicing through the lens of cultural competence, they can actually make certain things worse. And we know that public health is about preventing diseases, about promoting health and about prolonging quality of life. And we want to think broadly about prolonging quality of life. And sometimes just having that lack of cultural competence could actually undo a lot of the progress that has already um, been made. Oh, that's my one minute. And again, I want to acknowledge um, the help and thank the um, Natural Hazard Center for funding this and also the people of St. Croix for allowing me to bombard them and get information from them. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Constance Huggins. Thank you, everyone who has presented. Um, I am going to open it up now. We have about 15, 14 minutes for questions. So if you all just want to um, either use the uh, reaction bar to, to raise your hand and ask a question, or we can put it into the chat as well. OK? Anybody want to start off with a question? Let me see if I can see everybody. Does anybody have their hand up yet? OK, I will also, if the presenters also have anything they want to come back to and just kind of give a 
you know, I didn't say this, I remembered something I wanted to say, you can also pop in as well. Okay. Um, Dr. Santos Hernandez, I'm gonna call on you because I know you had quite a few slides at the end and I was really interested in um, some of what you were saying about code the focus groups where you're gonna co-design the um, risk products. I thought that was really interesting. I wondered if you, if there were some points that you wanted to get back to that I cut you off and you didn't get to, or if, if you wanted to comment on that, that would be great. Yeah, um, well, the focus groups particularly is one of the opportunities that we have to give back to the community. Uh, one of the things that have come up uh, in some of the interviews is the fact that residents don't know well what our researchers doing in their community. Uh, so that's one of the things that we plan to address in the focus groups. One of the things that we've been working on is on pretty much calling on colleagues who we know that are working in the area and asking them to record a small clip that we can uh, show during the focus groups to give a, 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 an overview of, of some of the projects that are taking place uh, in the community. Uh, the other thing that we plan to do in the focus groups, uh, it's also uh, present some of the findings of the surveys uh, so that folks know what are the results of, of the questionnaires that they've been seeing us walking around the community doing. Um, the other thing that uh, we will be working on in the uh, uh, focus groups uh, is the co-design of uh, visualizations to communicate uh, earthquake aftershocks. Uh, one of the things that the USGS has been working on, and Sarah was here, uh, Sarah McBride could talk a little bit about that, uh, is that the USGS has been uh, pulling together prototypes of visualizations to communicate uh, the aftershock forecast that they generate after large events. Uh, so we've been, we're going to be working with some of those prototypes, getting feedback. We've been doing part of that with, uh, with in the interviews with emergency responders but as we says we as we said we want to also include uh, residents and other actors that usually don't participate in this uh, design process uh, so they're going to be providing feedback on those visualizations and helping us uh, co-design and refine uh, those products so Sarah if you can talk a little bit the other piece uh, before I pass uh, the word to Sarah is the evaluation um, that we're going to be evaluating uh, the focus groups to learn a bit better uh, how we can uh, uh, enhance this process. It's, uh, we're really trying to uh, develop a methodology to promote participation in, in risk communication efforts. So that's the other piece uh, that is important. So Sarah can talk a bit about the prototypes and Nani, I can talk a bit about the visualizations. Great, thank you. Go ahead, Sarah. Thank you so much, uh, Jennifer. Fantastic presentation, and thank you for being just the best research leader possible. You've been amazing to work with. It's such a joy. Um, it's really important to contextualize that the southwestern Puerto Rico earthquake sequence is in the 99% of active earthquake sequences that we see around the world. It is a productive, productive sequence. That means it produces many more earthquakes than we normally see of earthquakes of 6.4s and their aftershock sequence which is why the USGS has been so interested in working with Jennifer and her team to really refine our aftershock sequence for our forecasts so that we communicate that information credibly and informatively to the public around what they can expect their experience is going to be with these earthquakes. And, you know, aftershock sequences can be incredibly vigorous and it can uh, stall things like rebuilding and recovery. And so we want to know what the emergency managers think and the planners and the people involved in recovery and also the community members and what kind of confidence as well as decisions that they make on these forecast products. So we have a text uh, aftershock forecast, a template that we've developed. It's been going active for about three years now, and we've been requested to add some uh, visualizations. We tried an infographic with FEMA uh, around the aftershock forecast in Puerto Rico that was specially made for Puerto Rico. It was translated in Puerto Rican Spanish as well as English. However, that, um, that visualization kind of missed the mark. It wasn't very useful, was it, Jennifer? <laughs> it, didn't, it, it had some issues with it, and that's because it was produced at speed and we didn't get an opportunity to test it. So what we've done is we've created a range of potential visualizations uh, that are um, some of them uh, 
have the ability for people to choose their own to choose their own experience. So they're interactive and they're in the visualization. And so Jennifer's helping us with everything around determining uh, tone and color usage and style and text and even mathematical equations that we show and doing all of those things. And, and the, the Aftershock team at the USGS is incredibly excited and grateful for the opportunity to be able to talk and liaise with people who are experiencing this Aftershock sequence. We haven't really had that opportunity to do that before except for one other location, which is in New Zealand. So it, it's a pretty important project for us. So thank you, Jennifer and team for supporting it. Great, thank you, Sarah. Jennifer, you had a, a couple more comments, I think you said? Many, yes. So I'm, I'm working on the evaluation component of the focus groups and I, I can just go really briefly through what we're trying to accomplish with that is really trying to understand the extent to which these focus groups are effective in meeting some of these objectives of creating that space for residents to have input on the process, understanding the components of that, which, which aspects of those are most effective in, in facilitating that information gathering from them and their confidence in the products they're helping to co-create those prototypes that they're developing. Um, they're also uh, establishing a knowledge base before the focus groups get started so that we understand some of the concerns residents have about what Jennifer talked about, residents, uh, scientists operating in their communities, what the science is that's being done and how their perspectives and knowledge are being consulted in that process. So developing some initial questions for those and understanding how their perspectives on some of these issues are changing after the focus groups. Again, trying to get at how these kinds of activities can be used as a mechanism for um, imp improving the relationship between the scientists working in these areas and the community and getting the community involved um, so that they're, they have better pathways to being able to access this information and developing that kind of trust that's needed um, for, for consuming these information products, understanding what their priorities are so that those can be responded to. Great, thank you, Dr. Campbell. Um, we have a question in the chat from Mary Linehost for Dr. Carl Kim. Um, she asks, I'm curious to hear more about the notion of training on pro-social sharing. What would that look like? Who would the audience be? Okay. Yeah, that's uh, what we're trying to figure out. It's, I, I think uh, we've, de we've developed lots of different training classes and it's really easy if you have a technology or a system, like we, we did FEMA's first class on drones, for example, uh, and then other types of typical structural changes, uh, you know, how to build a seawall, how to, you know, th those types of courses are, kind of much easier in terms of identifying both the target audience as well as what you are training to. Uh, this notion of training for sharing is a bit more challenging. Um, and I think uh, we, we've been trying to sort, sort that out in terms of uh, what are the skills, what are the, what are the, the frameworks for doing this? We know already the liability concern is a, is a big concern that, that, that should be raised. And are there templates? Are there, are there liability measures? Are there things that can be done to, to manage that, to, 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 to encourage the sort of sharing behaviors? I think that there are other issues as well, too, in terms of you still have to be very concerned about many of the other uh, civil rights, human rights, uh, other issues as uh, as well too. So we're we're in the process of trying to uh, sort this out. I, I want to turn this over to um, Junath because Junath may also have some insights in terms of um, uh, our, the work that we're trying to do around this. Great, great. Go ahead. Hi. Uh, thank you. Uh, I, I just wanted to add a little bit on the focus group discussion side. So we did two focus group discussion and, uh, and it was very uh, eye-opening for experience for us uh, for two levels. The first was the format itself and how the, um, how the, because in the past we have been doing a lot of focus, focus group in the island communities in, in, in Hawaii and in Samoa and Puerto Rico and other places. This time we went virtual but it was extremely successful we we we, yeah, uh, we couldn't like uh, imagine how how good it was uh, at the beginning we were kind of nervous but like people people's enthusiasm participation was so good i we really we, we really found encouraging and the involvement is still involvement and the interest is still there 
The second was how the how the cascading disasters, basically the the rigs, uh, kind of like unfolding disaster, can impact some of these our research activities. We also noticed that when we were doing a focus group discussion on June 20, 25th in, uh, in, in, in uh, combining participants from uh, Caribbean, especially Virgin Islands, U.S. Virgin Islands, and Puerto Rico. On the same day, I think there was uh, multiple uh, earthquakes happening in, in Puerto Rico, and we were very nervous uh, about, about the event. But, but, but it, 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 it basically, the, that really, imp actually, the, the participants were more reflective on how these COVID earthquakes and their experience of past disasters, especially Hurricane Maria and Irma, basically um, unfolded in, in, their, in, their, in their experience of sharing and what are the challenges. We got more press perspective uh, on, the, on, the, on the sharing behavior um, uh, uh, during the disaster. So that was, that, was, that was the two things I wanted to add. One more thing I want to add is we want to uh, extend this uh, research interview to the to more tribal communities. We also want to hear from the tribal communities how they are practicing some of these uh, sharing during disaster or after disaster to help each other. To, to, to leverage some of these uh, community bonds uh, to overcome some of the sufferings and, and losses uh, from the disaster. So that is our next step in this, uh, in this interview. Great, thank you, Juna. Um, we only have about two minutes left. Uh, Dr. Constance Huggins, we haven't had a chance for questions. I think Dr. Campbell has one for you, so I'm just gonna read that real quickly. Um, she asked, Monique, have you considered developing additional information or training projects, products from this project to, to facilitate more culturally competent practices in future disaster response? And I just responded, yes, that would be the next step based on the findings. I mean, it's, it's a natural next step. Um, and I think the information we got really provided us with some insights, some nuanced information that we can use to for the um, tailor the, the training product. So certainly the next step for us. Okay, well, we have one minute to go. I just wanted to thank everyone for participating in the session today. Um, I think we're gonna be communicating our findings um, going forward in, in, in future meetings, but it's been a real pleasure um, to listen to all the presentations. Um, and we will be putting up the recordings for people to listen to. Um, if they didn't, if you wanted to check out um, one of the other sessions, we'll have those up for everyone um, to be able to look at. So thank you again um, and have a great rest of your day. Great. Um, okay, I'm Kristen Cowan. I will be presenting on um, our study was called Hurricane Maria Mortality Study. We're ascertaining the excess mortality and associated risk factors following Hurricane Maria in Puerto Rico. Um, and I also worked with Diego Zavala on this, who's at Ponce Health Sciences University, who's not able to be here today. So the research questions that we wanted to answer uh, during this time period was, um, first of all, how many excess deaths occurred in Puerto Rico following Hurricane Maria from September 2017 to March of 2018 that would not have happened if there had been no hurricane? What were the most common causes of death in the six months that followed Hurricane Maria in Puerto Rico? Were there geographical clusters of excess mortality in the six months following Hurricane Maria? And which socio-demographic factors are associated with higher risk of death in the six months following Hurricane Maria? So um, the first three questions have been answered and we're in the process of answering the fourth question. So I'll provide preliminary information on that. And to provide some background to start, so exacerbations of chronic diseases at the individual level and health disparities at the population level can be common after hurricanes. A lot of times um, disasters in general highlight faults in our systems that lead to uh, larger disparities than currently exist. Um, chronic disease exacerbations and mortality can occur for many months following a storm, um, especially of the magnitude like Hurricane Maria. And these can occur for a number of reasons after a a hurricane or flood, such as a discontinuity in uh, chronic disease care, inability to fill prescriptions, environmental hazards like changes in air quality, um, infectious disease outbreaks, and uh, stress. So while some of the reasons are more at the individual level, many hazards and factors that may be associated with exacerbation of chronic diseases and death may vary in different communities that are more socially vulnerable than others. 
Um, in Puerto Rico, almost half of the population already is covered by Medicaid, and many of those are living with at least one chronic disease. So the severe infrastructure damage caused by Hurricane Maria eliminated access to the care that many patients need, particularly anecdotally, there's a lot of stories of individuals who need dialysis who are not able to access that or chemotherapy. Um, and so in the months following Hurricane Maria, access to care continued to be limited for a long time, along with environmental hazards like flooding and mold growth that may have contributed to death and disease among Puerto Ricans. So in the um, months following Hurricane Maria, Hurricane Maria hit Puerto Rico on September 20th of 20. 17, and in the year that followed, determining the number of people who died directly or indirectly from the hurricane was a really large subject as, of debate, as you can see here. Um, it was in the news a lot at the time. So the initial death toll from Hurricane Maria was reported to be only 64 deaths because the use of the CDC certification of deaths uh, related to disasters protocol was not implemented in Puerto Rico prior to the storm. So after uh, the death count of 64 was announced, a study was commissioned by the Puerto Rican government to George Washington University's School of Public Health, which led to the death toll later being revised upwards to 2,975 deaths that were attributable to Hurricane Maria. Um, and there's been a few studies that summarize all of these estimates. Um, one study estimated that uh, excess deaths uh, Excess mortality for September and October of 2017 ranged from 1,023 to 1,077. Um, but little has been done on top of this to identify mortality factors following Maria and the common causes of death after the storm. So for our study, we used uh, data from the Puerto Rico Department of Health Demographic Registry, which maintains death certificates. Originally, our study planned to do a manual review of death certificates, but because it had been a few years since the storm, we were able to collect the death certificates through um, a database where all the death certificates had been electronically entered, which made our work a bit easier to review them instead of having to do it in person during the pandemic. Um, so we collected mortality data from September 2013 to uh, or I mean, sorry, September 13th, 2016 to the end of March of 2017 as a comparison group. And then for the year of Hurricane Maria, September 13th, 2017 to March of 2018. And Hurricane Maria hit September 20th of 2017. So we included one week prior to the storm in order to account for um, morbidity that may have occurred, morbidity and mortality as a result of um, uh, preparing for the storm and relocating in preparation for the storm. So um, population data from the U.S. Census Bureau was also collected to calculate mortality rates at the, at the municipality level. Um, so the death certificate database includes sociodemographic information as well, like age, sex, race, marital status, place of residence, um, place of death, education, occupation, and type of death and Hispanic origin. Um, it also in, contains important information for public health officials like underlying diseases and immediate cause of death. So using this information, we developed a specific set of um, a specific variable that regrouped all causes of death using a list developed by the National Center for Health Statistics to classify deaths into chronic disease categories and um, other causes of death as well. So getting into our results, um, overall there were 1,650 more deaths in the post-Maria time period than compared with the comparison months in the year before. Um, there really was not a large difference in the makeup of these deaths. Uh, so you can see here that uh, about 55% of deaths in the year after Hurricane Maria, or in the six months after Hurricane Maria were among men. Uh, about 77% were 65 and older, and only 0.6% of those occurred among people under the age of 18. Um, most of the deaths were attributable to natural causes, um, followed by undetermined causes. So there was not a large difference in the makeup of the deaths, just in the number of them that occurred. And then looking at our results by disease categories. So you can see here, we looked at all of these different chronic disease categories uh, listed here and all, cause mortality, all causes of mortality as well.
So there were increases in the in the six month risk of death for cardiovascular disease, Alzheimer's, diabetes, sepsis, uh, chronic respiratory diseases, hypertension, in stage renal disease, and suicide. The only uh, disease categories examined that did not see a significant increase in the six month risk of death following Hurricane Maria were COPD, mental health conditions, asthma, and cancer. Um, we also adjust, uh, calculated adjusted uh, risk ratio for overall mortality, adjusting for month to account for seasonal trends, and we did not really see a large difference. We still had um, a risk ratio of 1.14. Examining the, uh, the trends in mortality by municipality now, so we wanted to look at if there was geographical clusters of changes in death because uh, that could identify places that need uh, improvement to infrastructure for those living with chronic diseases. And you can see here, um, it's important to note that September we did not use the whole month, so there was lower rates of death overall because we only started at September 13th for our data collection for both years. But for the rest of, rest of the months, you can see, especially in the months immediately following the storm, like October and November, there's a larger amount of municipalities that fall into this uh, highest category of greater than 88 per 100,000 for the mortality. And then looking, we don't see the same trends as much as you continue into the further than six month time period. Um, but it is important to note these uh, shifts, especially in these parts of the country uh, in the months immediately following the storm. So for our next steps, uh, our next steps are to use the CDC Social Vulnerability Index to classify municipalities into more and less vulnerable communities to examine differences in the overall mortality in more uh, vulnerable communities compared with those who are less vulnerable. So the CDC Social Vulnerability Index, which I think a lot of people in this breakout room already know about, um, it uses 15 census variables to help local officials identify communities that may need su more support before, during, or after disasters. So our goal is to use that to classify communities and then look at if there was increases in mortality um, among those that have higher vulnerability than lower. Um, we also want to um, find other sources of exposure data that could help to identify if other sources of environmental vulnerability increase the likelihood of mortality following Hurricane Maria. And once we have results at the community level um, on vulnerability and potentially other environmental um, exposure data, we'd like to work with the Hurricane Response Hub in Puerto Rico to disseminate our findings to public health officials within the territory. Um, so to conclude, there are some limitations of our study, of course. Um, death certificate data is subject to biases like misclassification of the socio-demographic variables like race and ethnicity. Um, we were also limited by the quality of the post-hurricane death certificate data. We had uh, originally hoped to review more of the narrative information, but because of the lack of uh, the increased workload and the lack of medical staff available in the immediate aftermath of the storm, the, it may have led to the death certificates being filled in with less detail immediately following Hurricane Maria. Um, also, because the information is de-identified, there's no ability to contact families of those who passed away and collect more narrative information. Um, another limitation of the study is that it doesn't capture deaths of people who left Puerto Rico after Hurricane Maria. So it's possible that with um, that people with the most severe chronic diseases left Puerto Rico due to Hurricane Maria and may have passed away elsewhere, and those would not be captured in this data set. Only those who died in uh, Puerto Rico would be captured. Um, but overall, our preliminary findings suggest that there were increases in the six-month mortality risk for cardiovascular disease, Alzheimer's, diabetes, sepsis, chronic respiratory diseases, hypertension, in-stage renal diseases, and suicide. The number of excess deaths when compared by major disease categories warrants further analysis to determine if these deaths had a greater number of contributing factors um, than the deaths during the one year before. Um, our final results will show which socio-demographic groups and geographical areas need to be targeted in the future for hurricane preparedness plans. And we hope to work with um, public health officials in Puerto Rico to inform efforts to better communicate proper post-disaster death certificate me methods for medical professionals in the future so that this um, 
they can be easier to analyze in the future. Um, and I can, I think I have a little bit of time if anybody has any questions now. Yes, I have a question. Um, have you guys seen or considered using temporal uh, aspects in your social vulnerability analysis to look at the demographic makeup of the location where people died, such as like looking at vulnerability through phase of disaster? From what I've seen in the literature and what I'm working on my dissertation, we don't really look at vulnerability in a temporal frame, which people are at risk at different times of disaster. And so it'd be interesting to look at the deaths and see, you know, who died post and during and who's at risk. I mean, there might be a pattern there that we just don't see. Yeah, I think that's a great point. I think a lot of the vulnerability measures that are available are only, they stay the same all year. So it's hard to look at those changes. Um, but I would love to talk about that more, about how we could look at that, if you have any ideas. Uh, yeah, I can send you my email. Great. Let's go ahead and hold all other questions until the end of our session so that we have all of our speakers have enough time to do their discussions. Do we have our next speaker for calculating the social vulnerability index for Guam available? Yes, I'm here. This is Yvette. Wonderful, thank you so much, Yvette. Go ahead and take it away. Let's see. All right. um, do you see my slides? They look great. Oh, thank you. All right, so uh, as I mentioned earlier, my name is Yvette Hoffaday and greetings from Guam. I am uh, presenting on behalf of my entire research team who unfortunately can't be here today because it's uh, 3.30 Guam time in the morning. Um, but nevertheless, we all participated in this work. Um, so I'd like to, uh, again, the title of our project is Calculating the Social Vulnerability Index for Guam. And I'd like to start off by putting uh, Guam into perspective. So I'll start off with the map. Guam is a U.S. territory located in Micronesia, which is in the Western Pacific. So if you, if you look at the map, it's actually the southernmost island of the Mariana Islands, which is an archipelago and is also home to the native Tomorrows. Um, so here's a map of Guam. Uh, the northern part of Guam is comprised mostly of limestone, which holds the island's primary aquifer, while the southern part of Guam consists of volcanic rock and more significant erosion potential. So like other small islands, Guam is at an increased risk for environmental and social challenges, which could also be worsened by climate change. And these types of challenges contribute to vulnerability. So for our project, we had proposed to calculate the Guam SVI. Um, as mentioned earlier, many of you are familiar with the SVI here, which is a tool that we're hoping to use to assess the uh, relative social vulnerability across our communities. Um, when I talk about the um, ranking, uh, just a reminder that number the SVI's number ranging from zero to one, so zero indicates the least vulnerable communities and one indicating the most vulnerable. So in the US, SVI is calculated using um, selected variables on US, uh, selected variables from the US Census Bureau tracks, while the US CDC currently provides rankings on the SVI for all states, as well as for Puerto Rico. Um, we're not included there, so we don't have, currently have data for Guam. Therefore, we pursued calculation of the SVR for Guam. And since Guam is stratified into 19 municipalities or 57 census designated places, according to our 2010 Guam census, we wanted to rank the SVI using both levels of stratification. We calculated the SVI using the Guam I'm sorry, the CDC method. And then we also added a Guam adjusted method. Um, throughout this process, we were able to share our preliminary findings with stakeholders and we elicited feedback from them. Our stakeholders included 
um, policymakers, government officials, community health workers, health professionals, educators, students, and representatives from private and nonprofit organizations. So again, we performed SBI rankings using the CDC method and the Guam adjusted method. I um, already talked about the CDC method, so I won't um, elaborate on that. But for the Guam adjusted method, what we did was we added three more domains based on the PCA um, uh, analysis. We added three more domains using additional data that were available from our 2010 Guam census. And they covered pretty much housing structure connectivity and other variables that reflect the migrant population. And we selected these variables simply because of our location in a region where we have high susceptibility to major storms and typhoons. So our housing structures, we collected information on that um, through our 2010 Guam census, um, as well as how people communicate um, during these uh, natural disasters. When we use the CDC definition of minority, um, what we noticed was that majority of the municipalities, specifically 14 of 19 municipalities, had minorities higher than 90%. And we didn't feel that this accurately reflected the domain for Guam. And since Tomorrow's and Filipinos are the dominant ethnic groups, we modified the minority definition to include non-Tomorrow's and non-Filipinos single race. And we use this modified definition for both the CDC methodology as well as the Guam adjusted methodology. So now moving into our, our findings. Um, here is a table that stratifies the least vulnerable municipalities by the CDC method and the Guam adjusted method. And regardless of the method we use, Agate, the, the municipality of Agate remained the most vulnerable municipality. Two other villages, which is Hagatnya and Derido, remained in the top five as well. So this is uh, most vulnerable municipality. This next one is least vulnerable municipality. So regardless of the methodology used, Pidi remained the least vulnerable municipality as well as three other villages, Tamuni, Asin Maina, and Santorita remained in the bottom five as well. Then for our census designated places or our CDPs, um, so the way our CDPs are broken down is it includes the municipalities as well as smaller units within the municipalities. So when we broke it down by the CDP, regardless of the methodology used, Ukudu remained the most vulnerable CDP. And three other CDPs, Astumbo, Isengsong, and Paget remained the top five as well. Um, I'd like to note that um, most of the CDPs are actually home to large communities of migrants in uh, the northern part of the island. Okay, and again, um, sticking with the CDPs, Nibbets Hill remained the least vulnerable CDP regardless of the methodology used. Um, three other CDPs, which include Nibbets Hill Annex, Opera Harbor, and the Finnegadsen Station also remained in the bottom five as well. I like to note that all these, CDs, all these CDPs contain mili uh, US military men. And with the exception of the Finnegods and Station, all these CDPs sit on some of the most elevated lands on Guam. Okay, um, what we also noticed is that some of the most vulnerable municipalities, so at the municipality level, the village was, um, or the municipality was most vulnerable, but they also had um, less vulnerable CDPs and vice versa, while some of the least vulnerable municipalities had vulnerable, some of the least vulnerable municipalities had um, um, vulnerable or more, more vulnerable CDPs. So this is an example to help illustrate that. 
The municipality of Derido was among the five most vulnerable municipalities. It contained three of the five most vulnerable CDPs, but it also contains some of the least vulnerable CDPs. And for us, this is critical information, especially for our local um, mayors. So each municipality in Guam is has a, a, a mayor. So there's a mayor for each of the municipality and for them being able to distinguish vulnerability within their municipality um, may help with uh, things like resource alloc allocation and proper planning for health emergencies. As I mentioned earlier, we um, solicited feedback from our stakeholders in our community and they helped to inform the implications of our work. So these are some examples of what came out of that uh, stakeholder forum. So from representatives of the Guam legislature, policymakers in Guam often struggle to find reliable and concrete data that shows what problems our community is facing. So we often must guess as to how to solve those problems. From our community health workers, they stated that collectively stakeholders agreed that the data will be useful in community planning for aspects such as village outreach, nutritional planning, and determining underserved areas who need certain services to respond by providing adequate and relevant services, resources. And then from our health professionals and academics, SBI can be applied to program development and applying for grants and in specific areas for public health and other social services. So we thought this, and we had lots of other great information. Um, these are just a few. So to close, um, we were able to calculate the SBI for Guam in multiple forms. Um, we noticed that the municipality level indices are useful for official, uh, local and national references to municipality boundaries. The CDP level indices are useful to local policymakers and public health practitioners as these indices provide the granular data identifying which communities have the greatest public health needs. Um, but overall, SBI uptake by public and private entities in Guam is beneficial for local strategic planning and to inform practice policy and academic pursuits. Um, we already initiated a conversation with the CDC on the possibility of adopting our SVI, so we hope to um, continue that discussion. And when the 2020 census data are released, we plan to um, update our work. Thank you all very much for your time and attention. All right, thank you so much, Yvette. That was another... Sorry, I think I had something going on with my computer there. Thank you again for your wonderful. Let's go ahead and we'll have our next speaker come up for us for relationships between distributions of fast grade poverty and health. And I do think I've seen uh, Allison here. So, Allison, go ahead and take it. Good afternoon. I'm, we're actually all going to participate. My name is Ana Gorbea, and I'm waiting for my colleague to share his screen. And I'm with Alice Chope, we will all be presenting. So, as stated, I'm going to be talking about relationships between distribution of disaster, aid, poverty, and health in Puerto Rico. Uh, we began this project discussing recent research by Smiley, Howell, and Elliot that demonstrated that in the aftermath of a hazard event, the change in experience in the economic and social ecosystem may hinder recovery and poverty. Uh, this was very disconcerting to us. Also, uh, how Howell and Elliott went on to uh, find that current patterns in aid distribution accelerated economic inequality and increased poverty across the 50 states. So these findings held very important implications for Puerto Rico where in the past four years, we had uh, faced several major natural hazard events. We had two category five hurricanes in 2017. We had thousands of earthquakes reaching up to a magnitude of 6.4 on the Richter scale. We of course also joined the global pandemic in March, 2020. Um, so these were all great challenges that we were facing one after the other. 
Laura, um, sorry to interrupt. Can you please turn off your video? Because people are having problems hearing. The sound is a little bit off. Thank you. Let's see if that works. Hmm. OK. So um, our guiding question was, how did the disbursement of aid after 2017 uh, impact the relationship between hazard damages, poverty, and population vulnerability to COVID-19 in Puerto Rico? I hope I'm being heard. So there we go. That's the guiding question. Thank you, Antonio. And so our, to answer this question, we developed four different specific aims. The first is that to examine the changing rate of municipal poverty between 2015 and 19 and understand whether damages from hurricanes Irma and Maria accelerated the increases in poverty. Second, we wanted to ascertain the influence of the disbursement of federal aid on the changing poverty rates. Third, we wanted to show the relationships between hurricane damages, disaster aid, ec economic inequality, and each municipality's ability to prepare for a public health threat. Finally, we wanted to use qualitative research to un uncover some of the underlying mechanisms in the relationships explored in the AIMS one through three. Thank you. Next slide, Antonio. So um, our research design is, of course, uses the convergence framework. It uses mixed methods. Our transdisciplinary approach brought together economics, anthropology, and public health. The quantitative analysis applied through AIMS 1 through 3 uh, used all 78 municipalities as sites. For the fourth AIM, we used quantitative analysis to inform the site selection. And within the qualitative research and the two municipalities that were chosen, we used interviews, a total of 76 interviews to inform our case studies. And with this, I leave you with Antonio, who will walk us through the uh, quantitative findings. Thank you, Laura. Um, first and foremost, please make a note that uh, the poverty rates in Puerto Rico are considerably higher than in the states, in the 50 states, with nearly half of the residents living under the federal poverty rate. So that's a, a main finding. Um, the poverty rate fluctuates from year to year. That's why we are highlighting the poverty rate in 2015 and on 2019. Um, so these statistics helped us to understand how poverty in Puerto Rico is changing over time, which is the key thing that we wanted to, um, to share. Somehow, oh, sorry, okay, here I am. So we first estimated using fixed effects uh, models in order to examine the change in poverty pre and post hurricane. Uh, now, we did this holding constant, um, all other demographic changes, poverty decreased from 2015 to 2017. As, as well, we held constant the changes in population uh, but poverty began increasing every single year. Now, um, I want to call your attention because this national average poverty rates basically mirrors previous research demonstrating disaster increases during, uh, you know, all the degrees that we can look for poverty. Um, so what's going on with the presentation? Okay, here. Um, furthermore, um, we uh, measured three different models in order to include this different hurricane variables. Uh, property damages, we found key finding here, is inversely related to increases in poverty, contradicting hence, you know, conventional wisdom and literature review. We also found that fatalities per capita have a strong positive relationship with a change in poverty rate over time. Now, this suggests municipalities that suffered the highest human toll from hurricane experience, a long-term disaster that caused poverty rate to steeply rise. This, in conjunction with property damages caused by the, by the hurricanes, did not help us explain the changing rate uh, in poverty. Lastly, uh, we want to show some correlation coefficients that um, and this is a nice finding. We found positive correlations between each of the variables in this aim. Um, please take into consideration that we also took into consideration some COVID 
um, 19 cases as the highest correlation coefficient that was the total amount of A dispersed. Together, that this allowed us to find a high correlation between COVID-19 cases and the number of fatalities from Hurricane Maria. Do recall that uh, COVID-19 cases were also positively correlated with Gini coefficients for each municipality. Now, finally, the correlation between COVID-19 cases and the total amount of property damages in millions of dollars was the, was the lowest, although it was also still positive. Now, for the last and the remain the next slide, I'm going to turn this to my colleague, Laura. Thank you, Antonio. So in the fourth aim, we were doing the qualitative research in two different towns uh, to guarantee anonymity and privacy to the uh, participants. We switched the names of the town. We, we provided new names. One is Suelo and the other one was called Nube. In Suelo, we have uh, that the smallest, it was the smallest relationship between aid and poverty. This was informed by our aim too, and yet it was still positive. The Suelo has about 70,000 a population. It's closer to the metro area and it had lower initial poverty and poverty de decreased by 19%. So that was the story of Suelo. In Nube, we found an average relationship that we saw in other municipalities between aid and poverty. Um, we also found this a town has around 40,000 people. It is described as being more countryside. It had greater initial poverty and poverty grew thereafter. And we used uh, uh, 76 interviews between the two municipalities to inform the findings that are in the next slide. Thank you, Antonio. So in the next slide, you will see an eco-social map. There we go. And you can see that um, the eco-social map tries to explain how the individuals relate to the different activities that supported them after the hurricane. And in, and in Suelo, we have that a higher percentage of households had success accessing financial aid, 50% versus 31% in the other town. 83% uh, of the total aid disbursed in Suelo actually went to individual households. The participants earning over uh, under 20,000, however, had difficulty accessing the non-monetary aid from social organizations. And that you see in the eco-social map, those rings, when you compare them to the next town are thinner and you see a fatter ring for government, uh, government support. So participants felt at the end a return to normal very rather quickly within like half a year and expressed, however, a negative outlook and more despair when we were asking them about the future. In the next slide, we see the findings from Nube. And in this town, 17%, only 17% of the people acknowledge receiving federal aid. 70% of total aid received in this area went to individual households. Uh, low income participants did talk about stronger network of support. Uh, in, in organizations providing them food, uh, checking in on them, providing them supplies. And so that's why in this eco-social map, you see fatter rings surrounding that individual providing that support. They did, however, show less support from government aid. And in the themes of these interviews, we saw what, a, a gratitude expressed and references to the strengthening of the social network, which were definitely um, at a loss, you know, did not occur in the other town. Now, looking at the shared findings in the next slide, we find that there were throughout both towns, a common themes of violence of bureaucracy. This structural violence um, was represented in how they spoke about battling uh, the infrastructure, about the violence that they felt, you know, the all the damages that they had received and the neglect that was being felt. There was cost to mental health and wellness that are amply uh, documented in both towns. And the resilience reserve that was theorized, that is theorized by Hernandez and et al. Uh, was evident in one town, but not in the other. So in Suelo, that cushion, that support between neighbors was short lived but not in Nube where we had the long-standing support. So we see that in face of growing poverty, social organizations helped stave off even greater hardship in Nube. And they were active partners in distributing aid, especially food during the pandemic. So Nube had that going for them. 
But however, in perspective, sharing food is good, but money to rebuild is better. And that is also common throughout both towns. And with this, I leave you with Allison to discuss the implement implications and recommendations. Thank you, Allison. Thank you, Antonio and Laura, for sharing our findings. So I want to talk a little bit about the implications of those findings. We see that current aid distribution process deepened poverty and health inequities post Hurricane Maria. And particularly in Puerto Rico, property damages did not coincide with increases in poverty, as Antonio demonstrated, but hurricane attributed fatalities did. Therefore, our results generally echo the findings of Howell and Elliott, their study in 2018, underscoring the urgency of translating these findings into policy changes. In their own words, they said that, <coughs> Antonio, <laughs> natural hazards do not just bring damages, they also bring resources. And equal aid is not equitable aid, especially when it is systemically designed to restore property rather than communities. So how do we see change? First, we must recognize the deep interaction between all these factors and that it reinforces the reality that economic policy is emergency preparedness policy, is disaster response policy, is also public health policy. None of these issues can be addressed in isolation and much less in the context of compound or cascading disasters that Laura described. Especially in regards to policymaking, it is imperative to adopt an equity framework proactively in all disaster response and recovery policymaking to avoid deepening existing inequities. Also, we need to continue to do research so that we can understand the interactions between these not so natural disasters that we know will continue to increase in frequency and intensity over the coming decades due to climate change and our human systems, which we can change. And one way we do this is continuing to use research to both inform policy and to evaluate its impacts. One example is that if we can better understand the roles of different types of organizations in e increasing or decreasing expected economic and health impacts, then that can help to guide policies and different aid distribution strategies. Our team developed five specific policy recommendations based on our findings. First, pretty obviously, a, we need to develop a differentiated approach to aid distribution to broaden access, monitor, monitor diversity, and use data to make regular adjustments. The identified connections between fatalities, economic inequality, and infectious disease distribution from our research demonstrate that this is a matter of life or death. Secondly, we recommend that FEMA should review and revise their aid application process to make it more accessible to low -income home or lower income homeowners and also create a budget for application assistance to help the lowest income homeowners and finally expand ownership documentation processes, options. Third, we recommend that the hazard damage assessment procedure should be adjusted to ensure that funds provided will enable repairs to be completed in both urban and rural communities. Sadly, among our sample, not even one participant received enough funds to completely repair the damage done to their house from the hurricanes. Fourth, we should review and revise assumptions about using small business small business administration loans as an alternative to aid for rural households. We heard many stories among our participants of them being extended debt instruments that they're required to pay back when they did not have the ability to pay them back because they're very low income in the first place. And lastly, our last recommendation is that public health measures such as morbidity and mortality should be used as inputs into aid disbursement strategies decisions to effectively protect people and communities over property. Property damages and fatalities tell two different stories, as you saw from our findings about the response to hurricane damages. We also have some public health implications here, a couple of ideas here that we think would be great to incorporate into public health practice. First, communications around the causes and dangers to public health of widespread economic inequality is essential. 
This will help the public to understand that property-focused disaster aid leads to more poverty. Poverty leads to poor health. And poor health in any part of the population helps infectious diseases to spread throughout the entire population. Next, we recommend actively maintaining regularly and regularly testing citizen networks, for example, through community mapping, vaccine campaigns, or other activities. And this will serve the dual purpose of sustaining the strength of social bonds while improving preparedness. Lastly, we just want to express our gratitude, of course, to the Natural Hazards Center, NSF and CDC for the funding, especially to all of our participants who provided their time and their stories generously. And then in particular to, to our collaborators that provided their expertise and their time, top among them in terms of contributing the most hours were Dr. Junia Howell, Junelis Moleiro, and Nicole Pecky. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for another wonderful presentation. All right, we are running just a few minutes ahead, so this is always great news. Let's go ahead and uh, bring up our final group of presenters talking about cascading disasters, gender, and vulnerabilities in southwestern Puerto Rico. I think I see Waleska. Um, let's go ahead and have your team take it away. I've got your time on my phone. And you're on mute. Sorry. Good afternoon. I'm going to share with you my presentation. Can you tell me if you can see it? We can you see the presentation? We can see it, but it looks like a web page. Okay, let me. I have technical problems here. Okay. I'm going to present it now. Sorry. Okay, you can see my presentation. No, I, we do not see it. Gabriela, can you help me with the presentation? Yes, I will share my screen. Okay. Thank you very much. Sorry. And can you see the presentation? It looks great. Great. Okay, thank you, Gabriela. <clears throat> Good afternoon, everyone. I am Waleska Sanabria, and I'm going to present you the, our, our work entitled Cascading Disasters, Gender and Vulnerabilities in the Southwest Region of Puerto Rico. Next. <clears throat> okay, over the next minutes, I will be addressing uh, the following point. I'm we, um, I am going to talk to you about um, these points that are related to media researcher and the undergraduate and graduate students who collaborate with us. Uh, I'm going to do a brief introduction or, or an overview of the research work. And I am going to talk to you or, or present Puerto Rico Natural Hazards between 2017 and 2020. Uh, to inform you about the methodology and report the findings, and finally, the implication to public health related to our research work. Next. Okay, as I mentioned, I introduce you to our research team that is composed by Jane Henry C. Gabriela Torres, Alitza Cardona, Anna Ferbern, Elizabeth Eaton, next. And the research team will not be complete without mentioning the help and collaboration of the undergraduate and graduate students, Claire Rilston and Lorreen Haywell from George Washington University and Emmanuel Maldonado. Uh, sociology master graduate uh, program student 
from the University of Puerto Rico, Rio Piedra Campus. Next. Okay. Puerto Ricans, especially and disproportionately, those living in the southwestern region of, of the island live among the worsening natural hazards and multiplying risk factors that led to compound disasters. Next. Since 2017, these events are proliferating and their damage is enduring. In addition, disasters are over overwhelming the reality, weakening Puerto Rican healthcare system. Next, <clears throat> with its inadequate workforce and debts. This in turn contributes to the attitudes of distraction, distrust sorry, among some Western Puerto Ricans toward both governmental and private sector disaster response and recovery efforts. Next. <clears throat> To understand the impact of this cascading disaster <clears throat> in the southwestern region of Puerto Rico, this study used a gender and intersectional approach to disaster analyze the idea that multiple oppressions and social identity co-occur among members of racial and sexual minority groups. Next. And that discrimination and inequality are compound along geographies of class and disability status. <clears throat> a gender intersectional lens to disaster builds on the scholarship to examine the effects of power relations and discriminatory conditions in, in worsening disaster conditions and in conventional responses to them. In the case, in the case of disaster impacted residents in the southwestern part of Puerto Rico, this lens contributes to a better understanding of the healthcare difficulties. By studying disasters using a gender and intersectional approach, we can deepen what is being learned about the ways disasters affect residents of the Southwestern uh, Puerto Rico and provide recommendations about how better to prepare and respond. <clears throat> Our research designs we, we use a mixed method approach uh, that employs surveys, interviews, and par participants of observation side bits to collect primary data. Data. So, our method with two surveys, individual, household, and organizations, incorporate in deep interviews to contextualize and expand the data gathered in the surveys and conclude with two weeks of participant of his observation site visits to key locations and communities. Mixed methods allow the research team to best understand and contextualize narratives of individuals and communities, experience of healthcare access in, cast, in context of cascading disaster. We conduct mixed method data collection remotely during COVID-19 pandemic from January to May 2021 and through on-site field component in June 2021. Once conditioned for responded and researchers safely permitted. Next. <clears throat> the guiding uh, research question were, how does Puerto Rican healthcare system interact with disaster risk and recovery, and how are cascading disasters affecting that system? Second, how do disasters in Puerto Rico interact with the distrust between communities and institutions, and how does this affect access to healthcare services? Third, do gender health challenges emerge because of interactions between the healthcare system and disaster? And finally, what strategies do vulnerable, vulnerable communities develop to prepare for future compound natural hazards? Next. Gabriela, would you like to explain the findings? Quantita in quantitative? <clears throat> Sure, I think I can. We can hear you. 
we can hear you. It's very okay. hard to manage the presentation as well as the as as the other uh, disappearing uh, elements. Uh, so uh, our survey, our individual survey, we look to see if there were uh, particular uh, disasters that were understood by the communities that we were working in the southwestern Puerto Rico, which had a different disaster set than the rest of the Puerto Rican uh, island. Um, we looked to see what they thought were the most impactful research uh, disasters. And that, as you can see clearly in this chart, it is the hurricanes, but also specifically the, the earthquakes. Uh, the economic crisis certainly comes before the COVID pandemic um, and other infectious diseases actually come uh, before the, the COVID pandemic and the economic crisis. And so it's interesting to see how there is a particular distribution of uh, disaster impact in the southwestern part of Puerto Rico that might not be the same as in the rest of the island. Uh, in terms of other findings uh, from our individual survey, uh, let me see if I can navigate to those and probably not um, while I'm talking. Nope, I don't think I can while I'm talking. Let's see if I can. Nope, not while I'm talking. So. I think after, uh, if I can ma make it to the next slide, it will have to be someone else talking because um, okay, I can do I it. Can I can navigate. Do it. So I'm here. I'm here at this one. So I'll finish this one off. Uh, and so we looked at the percentage of uh, households that included persons with disabilities, and what we found with this, which we are going to be talking about a little bit later as well, is a really high concentration of uh, households with persons with disability in the lowest uh, income brackets. And that has a lot of implications for public health uh, practice. And I will pass it on to Waleska from here. Thank you, Gabriela. Okay, our findings on site and on site interviews found. It's okay. Um, <clears throat> I'm gonna mention one by one. Continuing for infrastructure access to public roads and inhabited homes from hurricanes, earthquakes, and compounding new limitation on access from COVID-19 pandemic a deep economic crisis and a history of, the, of under service results in distrust in government services and supports infrastructure gap driven disconnection for poor communities due to a lack of reliable transportation options, high levels of reliance on NGOs, uh, charities and each other, <clears throat> home show market overcrowding of people and pets tenuous access to utilities, lack of resources for reconstruction and the stockpiling of household items, severe damage to schools and, and the underserving K-12 student, government records and the provision of core health and reconstruction services are on it, on available still in some areas like Wanica. <clears throat> And you're going to see some images related to Wanica and how uh, we found in our ethnographic research how the, they, have, they still have the same infrastructure even after the, the earthquake of January 2020. This was part of the ethnographic research in 2021. Uh, we have two minutes remains, okay. <clears throat> There is another image from Wanica. <clears throat> this image is from a trailer house uh, where we found a man of 90 year old man who, who live in this place. This is a house models in Guayanilla. 
Next. Implications for, for public health practice, differences in gender and disability status among Southwestern Puerto Rican indicated greater vulnerability for women and persons with disabilities to their region cascading disaster. Public spaces such as hospitals, schools, offices, fields, churches, and marketplaces compromise a dynamic context where vulnerability and safety are exchanged. Gender responsive public health planning needs to consider, consider the speciality of where people seek shelter or where they are compelled to remain. Next. <clears throat> Our household individual sur survey showed that there was a significant concentration of household units with people with disability. Uh, our organizational representative survey found that federal funds are highly concentrated in largest of healthcare providing organizations located in urban centers. Next. <clears throat> And the five challenges for public health practice, limited access to specialized and primary care, travel time to San Juan metropolitan area to attend appointments, and even application of basic health and safety protocols, absence of continu continuously functioning communication infrastructure, and finally, the absence of mental health support that impacts patients, healthcare personnel, and first responders. Next. And on behalf of, of our research group, we would like to thank the interviewees uh, and organization from the Southwest region of Puerto Rico, the Public Health Disaster Research Award, the NSF and the CDC and especially Larry Peak and Natural Houses Center at the University of Boulder, Colorado. Thank you. And thank you, Alaska. Another fantastic presentation. And we now have a few minutes to go ahead and ask our questions. I know there have been some questions about um, slide availability. We're not requesting the slides this time from our presenters. But if you would like them, we'd strongly encourage you to uh, reach out to the presenters yourself. Or if you would like, I'm happy to reach out to the presenters for you and get those slides and send them to you. Um, I also think that um, some people are curious about contact information after getting that recommendation. And um, just to be honest, I have not been all over the page that we have for this particular um, event. But I do know that everyone's names and their affiliation are on the page that I just linked to there. So um, I thought maybe we'd go ahead and start with, I know there were some questions right about the top, and maybe we'll go ahead and ask that first question and then open up the floor to see if there's anybody else with questions. And if there's nothing, we'll go ahead and ask the next question that's been placed in the chat box. So our first question came from Allison, and I believe it was for, um, I'm so sorry, let's just put this away. Kristen, I believe it was for Kristen. So asking, how did the study of excess mortality build on, contradict, or add to the study commission with the GWSPH? And please let us know if you uh, don't know what those acronyms are, because I don't know what they are. <laughs> yeah, I can try to answer that a little bit. So, um, that is the, so after the hurricane, there was a report from George Washington School of Public Health who uh, tried to assess the excess mortality in Puerto Rico after the storm. So there are a few differences, mainly that one, their whole goal was to look at the death, certificate, death certification process and assess how that could have been done better. And they also did calculate excess mortality, but they did not review actual death certificates for information or um, look at cause of death. They just looked at actual count, so uh, estimating a number of how many deaths occurred. Um, they did find, they do have more of a solid number of that almost 3,000 deaths that occurred as a result of the storm versus ours is just looking at the 
excess mortality by chronic disease categories and looking at which ones had an increase. So um, there are some differences and it, theirs seems to have a higher estimate than ours does of the excess mortality. Um, but that is all I know about that really. Thank you. Do you have any hypotheses about why that difference exists? Or did you say that you only looked at chronic diseases? I missed that. Um, so we looked at all causes of mortality for our overall numbers, but then we, for as far as cause of death, we only looked at chronic diseases. We didn't look at um, other things specifically. Um, so, and I do, they use different ways of estimating um, uh, population for their denominator, I know. So we use just like the sense, because it's been a few years now, we were able to use census information that exists for both years at the mortality. Uh, municipality level, but they had to estimate uh, how much population left after the storm. So I know our denominators are quite different, I think. So it sounds like your number might be more closer to accurate. Is that your thought? I hope so. <laughs> yeah, um, I think I think as more time passed, the data was able to get collected and uh, aggregated more properly for each municipality. So I'm not sure since they had to estimate that uh, population displacement, what that looks like for how accurate that was or not. Great, thank you so much. Great, thank you so much for that awesome question. Um, does anybody have any questions for Yvette, our second speaker, speaking about um, Social Vulnerability Index in Guam? I, I saw one question from, I think it was Heather. So Heather, I believe your question was, um, sorry, I'd have to go back to it. It's okay, that was my question of it. I was just Oh, oh about I'm so it. sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay. um, I was just curious how you thought the 2020 census findings might impact your findings um, that you've already run. Okay, yeah, so um, we believe that uh, within a 10 year span, there's been an increase in the migrant population, particularly from those migrating from other um, islands throughout Micronesia. We also have some new questions in the 2020 census that were not in the 2010, such as um, we ask about the Supplemental Nutritional Assistance Program. Um, so that's, there, there are some questions that we could potentially use. And there are some questions that we are actually losing in the 2020, which comes from domain two. So we'd like to see how <laughs> the new data uh, will change if it does. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Would anybody like to ask a question for group three, relationships between distributions of disaster aid, poverty, and health in Puerto Rico? If not, I did also have a question for um, Yvette. Hi, Allison. Hi. Um, I was really interested. It was, thank you for your presentation. It was really interesting. And I love to see the different areas that you added to the SVI. And I was wondering if you all have a sense of which either section or particular measures might have made the biggest difference. Because it was also super interesting to see the places where you were aligned with the CDC measure versus not. Okay, thank you, Allison. Um, what we believe it is a major contributor to um, our results is the minority, the modification of the minority variable. So if you know, if you recall, um, the most and least vulnerable um, areas kind of matched up with either of the methodologies, and that's because we used the modified definition for ethnicity in both cases. Um, and for the adjusted um, 
whichever variables were related to the minority variables, such as um, the, I think it was domain number three, we talked about, you know, not not U.S. citizens, foreign born, mm -hmm. uh, remittance payments, uh, that that would have contributed the most. So mm -hmm. we, we think that minority here is kind of the marker and that's why that is a very important um, indicator for us, hence the need to, to actually adjust that, that particular variable. Thank you. Thank you. I wanted to add one more thing. I was very interested in your in, in the distinction for uh, poverty and household structures and all the different variables you consider there. Um, how much impact did that make in your review and comparison, including all the infrastructure? Sorry, um, Laura, it was your question was it was coming in broken. I think I can translate for her. Um, we, <laughs> you might think we were very intrigued by the housing variable and the infrastructures, the public sewer and the water. Laura, maybe you can just nod if that's what you were asking about, but I think that's what she was asking about in particular. Okay, got it. Yes, yeah, so again, we, we believe those are also tied to the minority. Um, there are, uh, particularly in the northern part of the island where you saw that the SBI was really high, those are also places where there are huge uh, migrant populations. Some of those subdivisions are underdeveloped, so they don't have like the, the sewage there, they don't have proper plumbing. Um, so they're definitely uh, infrastructure issues. Um, but again, it's, it's related to the migrant population. Thank you. I hope that answers your question, Laura. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Thank you so much. Great. Does anybody have any questions for group three? Talking about, um, oh, I think I, I already said this one, but did it wrong. The relationships between distributions of disaster aid, poverty, and health in Puerto Rico. So one, one more call for group three questions. If not, I will selfishly ask my own question, which is how do the trends, like you talked about um, people not getting enough money to completely repair damage. Um, they only got some money to repair damage. How does that compare with trends um, for people who live in um, like the United States mainland? Um, for myself, I can say that uh, this is not speaking. I'm not aware of, we haven't looked at how it compares state line. Um, I think it's a great area of further investigation to see how the award repairs in Houston and Florida compare. I know that the building materials are different, so the costs are different. If you're repairing a wood or you're repairing or your house has uh, just different materials, it's just it's very different to repair a concrete house or wood. And it's just, I think we need to look into that. So thank you for your question, but I don't think we have the data right now. Yeah, I agree. We don't we don't have an answer to that. The only thing that I would say is that I think we can hypothesize that it compares unfavorably when we look at the amount of resources that were sent to those areas in terms of both financial aid and personnel within the first six months compared to the amount of resources that were sent here, which was much, much less. And then you also compare the damages, both in terms of fatalities, which we learned more about from Kristen's research and then in terms of just the bulk financial uh, property damages. And our um, study we didn't mention, but it didn't include crop damages, which is another big part of damage to what happened here in Puerto Rico. But um, Williston and colleagues have done uh, some great work in doing comparatives around um, looking at the damage compared to the response. And it's so unequal they, they have some I highly recommend the article because when you just look at their visuals it really hits you how incredibly unequal like the the damage is like this and then the, the resources provided are like that 
Um, but in terms of the particular question around the aid to the individual households and how far that went, we don't know, but um, we did say, and unfortunately Laura's uh, computer is not working very well, but we did see that problem was very uh, even more acute in the rural areas. In part, I think she referenced uh, the building materials. And so there's a challenge getting enough building materials to Puerto Rico in the first place. And then from Puerto Rico out to the more rural areas was more challenging. And then also the cost of labor in some of those areas was also um, higher. Thank you. That's sorry, we don't have a more thorough answer right now. No, I mean we all just keep doing to that save, us a, save us some time. I see there's a couple of questions for our group. Mm -hmm. uh, the first is which particular infectious diseases people were worried about. They were worried about Zika, but also chikungunya. Um, the, both mosquito-borne diseases for which there's very little data collection in terms of the incidence, but for which people know that the debris that, as you saw, was uncollected from the, the, um, the earthquakes it will continue to actually create a greater problem. And then the next question that I see is with regards to gender specific needs. Yes, we did see a lot of reproductive health needs. Um, we didn't talk so much about perinatal, but people talked about birthing uh, reproductive health needs, particularly during COVID in terms of detrimental outcomes for, for children uh, because of the following of uh, really uneven following of protocols, uh, detrimental outcomes for families in terms of being able to bond with their children when for COVID protocols, they were restricted from actually being with newborns, even though they had just given birth to them. Um, and uh, with regards to OB care, that's the same kind of problem that we have with any kind of specialist in the Southwest of Puerto Rico. As you saw, one of uh, our, our challenges is actually driving to San Juan and that's because that's where people have to go if they want to see any any specialist including OB and so certainly uh, so so perinatal care what can be done outside of an OB uh, office there might be some minimal that that it does not go down to the poorest of communities it's really a challenge even for people. One of the things that we did is we saw people across the income spectrum and it's really a challenge for communities to, to get any access um, to uh, specialists, but more so for the poorest sectors. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Gabriella. And thank you also, Allison, for your wonderful answers to these questions. We are coming down to our last few seconds. So is there anybody who would like to ask our last question? In that case, I would like to thank everyone for coming today. This has been truly incredible research answering really important questions that we do need to know answers to. So thank you so much for your fantastic, fantastic work. I cannot wait to see the final reports. I don't know about the rest of you, but I'm excited to read them. And I just hope you all have the absolute best day that you can. Thank you so much for coming.